aussi j'ai une fête chez moi Sur les gouttières ruisselantes Je l'ai trouvée sur un toit Dans sa traîne brûlante C'était un matin, ça sentait le café Tout était recouvert de givre Elle s'était cachée sous un livre Et la lune finissait ivre Moi aussi j'ai une fête chez moi Et sa traîne est brûlée elle doit bien savoir qu'elle ne peut pas, ne pourra jamais plus voler. D'autres ont essayé avant elle, avant toi, une autre était là. Je l'ai trouvée repliée sous ses ailes et j'ai cru qu'elle avait froid. Moi aussi j'ai une fée chez moi, depuis mes étagères, elle regarde en l'air. La télévision en pensant que dehors c'est la guerre, elle lit des périodiques d'hiver. Et reste à la maison, à la fenêtre, comptant les heures, à la fenêtre, comptant les heures. Lorsqu'elle prend son déjeuner, elle fait un bruit avec ses ailes grillées. Et je sais bien qu'elle est déréglée, mais je préfère l'embrasser ou la tenir entre mes doigts. Moi aussi j'ai une fée chez moi qui voudrait voler, mais ne le peut pas. C'est vrai, et les autres voient pas qui tu es. Ton sens, si je sais, moi aussi ça va me tuer. Mais ton sens, si c'est vrai, et les autres voient pas qui tu es. Ton sens, si je sais, moi aussi ça va me tuer. Tu t'angoisses, tu paniques, t'es en crise quand tu te prends en plein cœur. Sans pouvoir l'exprimer tout de suite, c'est trop fort, ça fait peur. Solitaire dans ton monde, tu chantes aux étoiles et canines la terre. Tu sens notre mer qui gronde, à bout de force, mais ne peut plus se taire. Tu sens la souffrance comme une bombe, le tic-tac en sourdit. Les puissants qui nous mènent à la tombe et se moquent de notre sort en prix. J'aimerais te dire que ce monde, les villes, finira par se réveiller Mais j'ai bien peur que ça ne tienne qu'à un fil Mais rassure-toi, toi tu seras sauvé Ton sens si c'est vrai Et les autres voient pas qui tu es Ton sens si je sais Moi aussi ça va y me tuer Et ton sens si c'est vrai Et les autres voient pas qui tu es Et ton sens si je sais moi aussi ça a failli me tuer Avec ta petite gueule d'ange Tu nous fais voir des masques colorés Tous ces gens qui te croient innocents Mais toi tu voyages dans l'obscurité Avec ta petite gueule d'ange Tu laisses croire et ne semble qu'indiquer Que dans ta tête y'a que des fleurs, des sourires Des papillons et du chevanier Je ressens ta souffrance, je la vois Je l'écoute elle s'en va, j'ai déçu, c'est normal, mais ce n'est pas la seule route C'est à toi d'exprimer ta beauté, d'éclairer de tes yeux Si autour de toi rien ne brille, à toi d'être fort et d'y croire pour eux Mon chemin
monde qui fourmille de fantômes On t'en fera des croche-pieds Cherche en toi cette lumière au cœur d'un humain Et bien plus beau de ce qui n'y paraît Ne laisse pas l'ignorance te duper Ne crois pas leurs mensonges Ils te donnent ce qu'ils peuvent, ce qu'ils ont Existe en toi bien plus que ce qu'on t'a inculqué Et ton sensible c'est vrai Et les autres voient pas qui tu es Trop sensible je sais moi aussi ça va y me tuer Être sensible c'est vrai Et les autres voient pas qui tu es Être sensible je sais Moi aussi ça va y me tuer Sensible, je sais, moi aussi ça va y me tuer. Être sensible, c'est vrai, et les autres voient pas qui tu es. Être sensible, je sais, moi aussi ça va y me tuer. Que tu peux être très dur de ces gens malhonnêtes qui te promettent la lune, leur laissant ton pouvoir pour qu'ils te manipulent. Ta précieuse liberté est parfois même têtue. C'est faux, tu te crois à l'abri, tu te moques du monde, tu juges avec mépris. Un pauvre intelligent pour un si petit prix se voit dans la face et se joue ceux qui suivent. Aveuglé par l'or, s'entend de sa bouche, tu vois ses paroles délicieusement à la louche. Le bras du Paul ou juste ce bout qui t'éclabousse De son air à Guicha qui te compte sa soupe Good morning, uh, I want to welcome you to this prom symposium. Uh, my name is Jörg Steiger, I'm uh, from the University Hospital of Basel. I'm not a prom or value-based healthcare guy. Uh, my experience lies more in transplantation medicine and for that I'm doing the quality control and the benchmarking for all, all organs and all transplant centers in Switzerland. But I'm completely unexperienced in PROMS, so it's I'm very exciting for me to learn more about that. It is the third uh, value-based healthcare symposium. The first one was also here in Basel 2018 and the second one one year later 2019 in Zurich. We did not have one in 2020 due to obvious reasons. It is the second symposium uh, in excellence in patient care in cooperation with the University Hospital of Zurich and it is the first one with a hands-on seminar in advance organized by the local committee. I want to thank you there for, in particular to Florian, Annabelle and Selina. Now <clears throat> looking back at value-based healthcare, uh, there is, was a pioneer publication redefining healthcare in 2006 by Michael Porter and Elizabeth uh, Theisberg. And I'm uh, very happy that she will be a keynote lecturer this afternoon, just following this introduction. In 2016, uh, for the University Hospital of Basel, value-based healthcare started, and there the major driver, in the beginning he was the only driver, uh, was uh, Christoph Meyer. He's also here as a moderator. I'm quite happy he moved to Zurich. Uh, I don't know why you can move from Basel to Zurich, but uh, he might explain that a bit later. <clears throat> in uh, 2017, the first PROMS were implemented here in Basel. It was for breast cancer patients. This was done by Walter Weber. He's also here as a panelist. Uh, and then uh, up to now, 19 PROMS sets were implemented, all completely digital five of which were developed in-house. So uh, there is quite a large experience here in PROMS. 
4,288 patients were included per end of March of this year. And some current milestones of the University Hospital of Basel, I can mention that because I was not involved, uh, because it's quite impressive. In 2019, value-based health care became an official part of the University Hospital strategy. In 2020, uh, the University Hospital got the recognition as one of three exemplary public value-based healthcare hospitals in Europe, implementing value-based healthcare in Europe handbook for pioneers, published by Gregory Cutts, and he's also a speaker this afternoon. And in 2021, reference was made to the PROM project in the University Hospital of Basel as an international lighthouse project in patient reported outcome measures, an international comparison by Sophie Ernst, and she's also here as a speaker. So I'm uh, looking forward to learn more about uh, PROMS, value-based healthcare, and Florian will give you now the real introduction and lead through the program. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you to Jörg for the introduction words. And again, hello to all the guests here in Basel and to all the other guests uh, on, uh, uh, participating online. And I hope we'll have the same success as we had in the morning. And I would only show you how to work with the Slido, where you can place all your questions. For those guests who are online, you can look after your streaming, uh, under your streaming, and under your streaming, you find the area to put your, all your questions in. And in this area, you can also um, like those questions. And furthermore, we will show you the, um, the, um, the, the word how you come in. It's prom, it's prom 2021, hashtag prom 2021 on slido.com, where you can get to all the questions and you can put them inside. And now it's a real honor for me to introduce a special person. And I'm really happy that we have here in this afternoon some of pioneers of value-based healthcare and pioneers of PROMS. And it's an honor for me to introduce a surprising guest. And the surprising guest, which is not in the program, is Christina Ackermann. Christina Ackermann was the second founding president of ITEM. We have also here the founding president later on this afternoon. And Christina Ackermann was so great that she was able and wants to introduce a pioneer of value-based healthcare, what is Elizabeth Theisberg. Elizabeth Theisberg is one of the authors of Redefining Healthcare, the book published 2006 with all the information and all the grounding information of value-based healthcare. So I would like to hand over to Christina Ackermann to give some words to us, to you, and to Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ritter, and also Professor Steiger, and a very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today's keynote speaker is, as we have heard, very well known to us as one of the creators of the concept of value-based healthcare delivery and for writing Redefining Healthcare, co-authored with Professor Micah Porter. But there is so much more. Her insights from research on redefining culture, measurement and payment to enable high-value healthcare are used to transform healthcare globally through education, offering, for example, a Master of Science in Healthcare Transformation, but also through the development of tools that help organizations create and implement value-based healthcare strategy. At present, Professor Elizabeth Teisberg is full professor at the Delhi Medical School at the University of Texas at Austin and the executive director of the Value Institute for Health and Care, being an integral member of the leadership team and faculty at University of Texas at Austin's Dell Medical School, and a professor at University of Texas at Austin's Macomb's School of Business. Professor Teisberg earned her PhD in engineering at Stanford University 
She previously served on the faculties of Dartmouth Giesel School of Medicine, University of Virginia's Darden School of Business, and the Harvard Business School. In other words, you will hear from an expert in transformational innovation and the implementation of high value healthcare, who speaks to and advises organizations around the globe. But there's even more. On a personal note, I would like to tell you about the great leadership Professor Teisberg shows in everyday life as well. When I joined as president of Aichung, she together with her colleague, Professor Scott Wallace, were among the first persons to reach out. They both became essential in supporting and guiding the Aichung mission of unlocking the potential of value-based healthcare by defining global standard sets of outcome measures that matter to patients. Such personal engagement is a characteristic of Professor Teisberg, and in line with her always reminding us about the importance of sharing, because when sharing with each other, we all improve and become better equipped to reach the most important goal for healthcare systems globally, to restore healthcare to its purpose, which is health. And completely aligned with this spirit is today's event, the third symposium on value-based healthcare, this time with a focus on patient reported outcome measures. So I would like to congratulate the organizers and together with you and everyone joining at the University Hospital of Basel or virtually welcoming the Cullen Trust for Higher Education Distinguished University Chair in Value-Based Healthcare, Professor Elizabeth Teisberg. Thank you, Christina. Um, Dr. Ruckerman has pioneered the global work in, in enabling people to share outcome measurement so that they can drive improvement. She's been um, foundational to getting value-based healthcare really off the ground worldwide. She is a valued member of our faculty at the University of Texas at Austin. And as she said, a treasured friend. Um, I thank you, thank you so much, Christina. Um, what a nice surprise to have you uh, here this morning. I didn't know you were going to be part of part of this event. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you also to Dr. Florian Ruter and the University Hospital Basel. I regret not being there in person. Sometime soon, I hope. Um, I have enjoyed the opportunities to work in Switzerland over many years now. And, and I've always enjoyed the opportunities to work in systems with the solidarity to have health insurance for everyone. It's a foundational enabler of value-based healthcare. I bet it has crossed your mind that it's odd to work with an American on healthcare issues. The US has extremely high per capita spending on healthcare without better results. And still 30 million people are uninsured. That's 11% of those under 65. There is universal coverage for people over 65, but under age 65, the only universal coverage in the US is in the emergency room. Imagine a system that lacks universal access to primary and preventive care. That means many people don't get care at the right time or the right place or in a setting where they develop relationships. The US approach is nonsensical. It ensures that significant amounts of care are delivered only in the most expensive setting at later stages of disease progression and without continuity of care. That approach has tragic results for many people. So I'm not here to excuse the US payment system, but it does offer a cautionary insight, which is don't try to reduce spending or manage budgets by cutting early stage and preventive care. That's a huge US mistake. While the idea tempts many governments with the logic 
of getting people to have more skin in the game for healthy living, cutting back on payment for early care creates problems akin to the US's system that fails so many people. Inequities and disparities defy the purpose of healthcare to help and to heal, to improve health for each and for all. So what does it mean to improve health, to improve the outcomes that matter to patients and families? Can we use PROMS to understand and improve these outcomes to achieve high value care? Several years ago, Scott Wallace and I did a lot of work with women who had breast cancer. We found that after they understood that they would live, their top concern, the functional outcome that most worried women with breast cancer was cognitive impairment, what patients call chemo brain. They spoke of losing their job, of being unable to do family finances, of stress in their marriages, or not being able to read to their child but their beloved doctors didn't have this on the radar screen. They weren't tracking chemo brain outcomes. They weren't studying how to manage or reduce it. They weren't counseling patients about how to mitigate it. We need to ensure that we measure patient-centric outcomes. And we can't presume that, they know what, that we know what they are, that we know what matters most to patients but we can ask. And this is the opportunity of patient reported outcome measurement, enabling transformation that is truly patient-centric, human-centric, relationship-centric. Like most things, it can be done well or not so well. When transformation is done well, we really learn what outcomes matter to patients. We understand the obstacles or gaps that they face in their healthcare journey. We create integrated practices that offer solutions to address gaps and improve outcomes. We offer relationship-centered care. We measure outcomes during care as well as after care. We use outcome feedback to shape care in the moment to be effective and empathetic and to learn. We improve care and outcomes over time so that future patients benefit. We share and compare the outcomes data and insights about how to achieve them, improving the profession of medicine and the dynamic of healthcare becomes ongoing improvement in patient outcomes and in the efficiency of achieving them which is what pursuing value for patients is all about. So the biggest opportunities from PROMS come not just from improving how we measure, but also from how we use PROMS to deepen empathy and relationships and to improve care, care design, processes, and outcomes. So our team, the Value Institute for Health and Care at the University of Texas, Austin, works with organizations worldwide on implementing high-value healthcare. We've had the pleasure recently of working with EIT Health on improving the health outcomes for individuals and families on designing services, solutions that achieve better outcomes for people who are underserved or who experience below average outcomes now. No matter how good your team is, some of your patients achieve outcomes below the average of those you serve. And unfortunately, you may not know how your patients' results compare to others, how many of your patients achieve outcomes above average or below average for your country or your region. We tend to presume that eminence means excellence, but it may not. And we like to hope that good process ensures good outcomes, but we know that often isn't true. 
So we need outcome measures and they need to be patient-centric. Patient-centric, personalized, individual, it's all good, but it gets confusing pretty fast. Ironically, in the name of treating patients individually, healthcare processes are often inappropriately variable. Worldwide, when variation in a country or area is studied, the results show stunning variation in processes and in outcomes that can't be explained by patient differences or by medical science, but only by where the patient presented for care, which region, which facility, or which clinician. Healthcare delivery needs to be local, but the science behind it should not be. Healthcare systems can be improved to deliver better outcomes for more people, more reliably, with fewer disparities, but to achieve that, measuring outcomes that are meaningful to patients needs to be normal, and it needs to happen during care. What you don't measure, you may be just excusing, and what you do measure, you can intentionally improve. Surely then, you want to measure what's most important. So you need to know what outcomes are important, not only to clinicians, but also to patients and families. Why patients? Okay, given that you are at a PROMS conference, you already know this. Patients are why healthcare exists. So whether or not outcome measures are patient reported, they could be reported by a social worker or a nurse or another clinician. They need to be patient-centered, truly reflecting the patient and family perspective on whether healthcare is helping. Lately, there's been a lot of attention to PROMs developed for research that are too long, too focused on clinical outcomes, and really aren't patient-centered in the sense of measuring whether patients were helped with what really matters to them. So using problems well requires knowing what matters and using that knowledge in care design, in care delivery, and in care improvement. In the breast cancer example with which I started, knowing that avoiding chemo brain mattered suggested to the clinical team an array of opportunities, such as improving patient education, adding a dietitian to the team, learning about existing research on mitigating cognitive impact, starting new research efforts on chemo brain and minimizing it, and personalizing care with genomics, many innovation opportunities. In addition to understanding the outcomes that matter, you need to understand from the patient perspective what gets in the way of success. Human-centered design of healthcare solutions starts with understanding unmet and even unarticulated needs. This means doing research with patients and families to understand not only their hopes and fears about outcomes, but also the obstacles and gaps that impede achieving the important outcomes. This gives critical insight for transformative change. The Value Institute for Health and Care uses a qualitative research approach that works with groups of individuals facing similar medical challenges and life circumstances to gain these insights on what matters and what gets in the way. We found that patients often don't tell these things to even wonderful beloved doctors and nurses. Instead, Patients communicate what they most want to say, which is, thank you. So even the most caring and respected clinicians may not be hearing about challenges that their team could help patients to address. So qualitative research with patients is an important starting place. And this is a place where the value perspective is powerful. Value is created at the level of helping the individual and the family, the level of that relationship with the clinician or clinical team. 
While every human is unique, there are many shared needs and situations. And with the right research, you can anticipate some really key concerns and you can improve care delivery and speed learning for the clinical team by tracking a small set of important outcomes and working to improve those outcomes for each of the individuals in that patient group. Choosing a small set of prompts is different from, but related to, asking each patient what matters to them, what brings you joy. You should discuss individual goals. You need to know people and connect to them. Relationship-centered care delivery is foundational to high-value healthcare. Understanding individual goals enables personalization of care. And you also need measures of outcomes that deeply concern most individuals facing these similar circumstances. For illustration, the outcome, the shared concern may be retaining eyesight. For individual patients, the goals may be expressed in terms of driving or reading or doing needlework. So you measure eyesight and you talk with patients about their personal goals. But you don't need to measure the ability to do needlework for every patient. Having done hundreds of these qualitative research studies, we've observed that when the group has shared health challenges and shared life circumstances, there will be a handful of widely shared concerns that are deeply important. And these robustly fall into three categories, capability, comfort, and calm. These are intentionally positively framed and positively measured in terms of what patients and their clinicians want to achieve. Capability is the reduction or prevention of disability. It is functional outcomes. Comfort is relief from suffering, emotional or psychological, as well as physical. And calm is the prevention of chaos. It's delivering care in ways that make it a solution rather than increasing the burden on the family or the patient with confusion or inconveniences or challenges. And since calm is the outcome of good patient experience. So it's not a prem, it's an outcome. And it goes beyond hospitality or experience in the clinic to how care affects your life outside of the clinic walls. Targeted measures of these outcomes, capability, comfort, and calm, allow the clinical team to study and improve the effectiveness of care. And it can be very simple. I'll offer two examples. There's a pediatric psychology group at Cincinnati Children's Hospital that decided that it needed a way to improve care for children with obsessive compulsive disorder. They knew the care was variable. Frankly, almost every study everywhere shows unwarranted variation in care. And they wondered if they could do better with and for these children and families. Unfortunately, the existing verified validated assessment measurement took 45 minutes to fill out, which meant it couldn't be done in a normal appointment. So they rethought the success and boiled it down to four simple questions for patients, which they administered with a simple patient reported outcome chart that we affectionately call the monster chart. And Axel, we can put up the monster chart now if you'd like. There we go. Um, so the monster chart originally had four simple questions. The first one is, how's it going overall? The second, which has a game controller on it. This is an old fashioned looking good game controller, but the second was who's in control, you or the OCD? So this is a measure of comfort or of distress. The third question was, how are you doing on your schoolwork? This is a measure of capability because school is a child's job. And then the fourth question is, how's it going with your friends? And this is a measure of calm. When life isn't okay, friendships suffer. So they had the child fill out the monster chart at 
each visit, every visit, using paper and pencil. And they used it in the care. They discussed it with the child or with the family. And they tracked the answers then for each child over time and analyzed the patterns. Then they were able to ask, as we see different patterns for different kids, is it something different about the patient or the circumstance or the care? And they found that there were some patients making consistent, steady pro progress. And what these children had in common was two therapists who used the same cognitive behavioral therapy approach. So the team shared the results and the success stories of kids and coached other therapists on how to use it. And they soon had many more kids making consistent progress, improving faster and getting out of the diagnosis of OCD. Applying the long form, the verified validated instrument confirmed 95% agreement on which patients we're now out of the diagnosis of OCD. And so now the therapy required fewer sessions, which reduced the cost. It reduced the burden of treatment for the family, better outcomes, better experience, lower cost. That's success. So a few key measures, consistent categories, but not the same shared concerns for every condition. Think about it. Even in vo avoiding mortality isn't always the right measure of success. It isn't the measure of success in hospice. Frankly, nor should it be the measure of success for your dental cleaning or your annual physical. One more thing to note in the OCD example. They focused on helping with the outcomes that mattered to the family, the reason that the family had come for care not just on the hospitality of the visits, wait times or parking, not just on net promoter scores. Okay, don't get me wrong. Respect, safety, and compassion should be given to every patient. My point is simply that kindness and safety should be the norm, not the stretch goal. Kind, safe care should focus on helping improve health outcomes. The doctors who made the OCD innovations explain that when they started, they were very uncertain what they could achieve because they know, of course, that every patient is different. And that's true. The specific symptoms varied from one patient to the next, and the specifics of the therapy differed. Still, there could be a systemized process of measuring and improving patient-centered, patient-reported outcomes by understanding the shared outcomes that matter. In this case, that was reducing distress by improving functioning at school and comfortably dealing with family and friends. For individuals with diabetes, hypertension, and neuropathy, while the outcome of being able to use one's feet is highly important to many patients, the individual goals sound different. I need to be able to walk my dog. I want to teach my grandson to hunt. I'll be full of joy when I dance at my daughter's wedding. Asking about sources of joy in your life rather than just the chief complaint enables care to support resilience for patients and support relationships with clinicians. In this way, PROMS can be analyzed and used to support relationships and support the learning and improvement of clinicians and teams, which in turn improves care and outcomes for future patients. This is important to supporting professionalism. At UT Health Austin, where I work, the joint pain services are provided by an interdisciplinary team that integrates physical therapy, social work, psychology, and dietitian services, as well as orthopedic surgery for those who need and choose it. But through shared decision making, that, that through shared decision making that considers processes and outcomes, fewer patients choose surgery. Still, they stay in the embrace of whole person care with non surgical care 
by this multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary team. The team collects proms that measure capability, comfort, and calm using validated measures for all patients, those treated medically as well as those treated surgically. And the outcomes are far above average in the region. And the surgical outcomes for which there are national benchmarks are far above the national average. These patients go home sooner, they go directly home rather in, than into nursing care, and they achieve significant functional improvement and pain reduction, also improvement in quality of life. So their, their 360 whole person care recently won a European value-based healthcare award for patient outcomes. One thing that makes this really impressive is its context. Yale Medical School opened this service for people who have no insurance and who've been underserved. When we started, there were 1,200 people on a wait list of 14 months, people in grinding, disabling pain. And in a matter of weeks, everyone was called. People were seen by the interdisciplinary team and the wait list was cleared without hiring more surgeons. These patients mostly had multiple comorbidities due to previous lack of care. So they were higher complexity and severity, but they have achieved better outcomes. The thing is, pain is complicated. As the lead surgeon likes to say, knee surgery is a horrible treatment for depression. When someone has horrible joint pain, they need help. And that help might or might not be surgery. The question isn't, did the surgery go well? but whether the person regained capability, comfort, and calm. This team works with the person to figure out what will help and offer a solution that works in their life. In short, this team has a system for offering personalized care and for tracking the improvement with PROMS from that care. When we identify the gaps, when we know which patients are succeeding and which are not, we can quickly gain insight on what works and why. This enables and drives improvement. Think about the OCD team that quickly moved from highly variable results to consistent success by measuring PROMs during care and then responded at two levels, to the individual patient and by improving the processes clinicians used. When we identify a gap, we can work to address it. We need to have the courage to measure patient-centered outcomes with the attitude that facts are friendly. We need to trust patients to tell us if the care really helped their capability, comfort, and calm. And we need to look for and see the existing gaps so we can do better. We can improve health. We can improve care. We can make kindness and respect the norm, and we can reduce health disparities. It all comes back to understanding and addressing unmet needs, even unarticulated needs, the needs of the people we serve. Please be invited to reach out to the Value Institute for Health and Care. You can reach directly to us, or you can reach us um, also directly through Christina Uckerman. Um, we're building an international community of people transforming healthcare and supporting each other's success. Thank you very much. Yes, Elizabeth, thank you so much for your great talk and it was really an honor for us to hear about your insights, about your great experience to value-based healthcare and PROMS. And now I would like, before you get the first question from Christoph, I would like to introduce him. Christoph Meyer, former Chief Medical Director of University Hospital Basel, my former boss. It's not easy to introduce my former boss. He is now Director of the Department of Internal Medicine of the University Hospital in Zurich. He is member of the newly founded Federal Quality Swiss Commission. And as former chief medical officer of the University Hospital Basel, he was my mentor and was deeply involved 
into planning of this symposium, and at least, then I'm at the end, he was the guy who brought the idea of value-based healthcare to Basel, and thus back on the Swiss stage. And that's, again, the line to Elizabeth, because she brought the ideas of value-based healthcare to Switzerland in 2008, and Christoph, you were the guy who reanimated these ideas for Switzerland. Now he will make the moderation and have the questions. And at least the Slido, there you can post all your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florian, for the kind introduction. Thank you for having me here. We will have a plenary discussion afterwards. So I think I was told I'm allowed to ask one question to Elizabeth, and obviously to thank Elizabeth for your marvelous plenary lecture. Thank you very, very much. My thank question you. Would, I mean, as Florian mentioned, you have written two years after the seminal book with Michael Porter, you have written on behalf of the Zurich Association of Physicians, <laughs> a report on value-based competition. And I looked at this report again, and 13 years ago, Elizabeth made eight recommendations for the Swiss healthcare system. And I read you just four. One is measurement of risk-adjusted outcomes is the top priority. Second, the Federal Office of Health should actively support such measurements. Third, competition among healthcare insurers should be based on quality indicators. Fourth, electronic healthcare records are urgently needed. Elizabeth, I'm very sorry to tell you, I don't have to take a vote in the auditorium. None of this happened in Switzerland 13 years later. So my question to you is, how can we move the cheese so that the system moves in the direction you so brilliantly outlined before? <laughs> so, uh, so thank you. Um, uh, you know, um, first, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed that work and the people that I met in that process. The experiences I had in Switzerland uh, changed me from someone who was uh, almost, almost too shy, you know, too introverted to someone who makes friends now all over the world, thanks to the friendships that started in Switzerland. So it was, uh, it was a wonderful experience in, in that regard. And I want to say thank you to you for that. Um, Switzerland is not alone in that these kinds of recommendations, um, have not been, um, followed as much as we would, as much as we would like. Right? Measuring outcomes has turned out to be a harder thing for people to embrace than I would have thought. After all, you come into medicine for the purpose of improving the outcomes for the people you serve. And so um, I would have expected that to take hold more easily. I still think that it is really, really the critical enabler because when clinical teams uh, start measuring outcomes that really matter, not just measuring um, processes, it becomes meaningful very, very quickly. So what we see is that the, the groups that really begin embracing outcome measurement are the ones that push it forward the fastest. So my thought on that is, changed from in those early years thinking that we needed to just get going with it because obviously it would happen to thinking that we need to require people to participate in outcome measurement. We don't need to require them to meet a certain level. We don't need to tie it to their pay. We don't, we just need to require people to participate in measuring outcomes and uh, participate in, in registries so that they can see the outcomes for their patients, they can see when they're improving them, and they can um, share and learn with others. Most of the electronic records that people use are really set up more around finances um, than they are around outcomes. And so we need to think differently about the electronic records so that their design is to support the clinicians, support the clinical teams, and make their work and their success easier. 
Well, you know, so much talk about burnout, so much experience of moral injury and burnout is occurring for clinicians now. And part of that is what I think of as a self-inflicted wound, meaning that when clinicians don't measure outcomes, that administrators and leaders and governments measure processes instead because you, they can measure the processes. So if you want to be measured on what's meaningful, on what you're really achieving, and on the purpose of your work, you need to be the person that pushes forward, be the team that pushes forward outcome measurement and participate in outcome measurement. Because if you don't, you will be measured on other things that come down to being measured on, are you working faster? Are you working harder? Are you working more? Um, rather than, are you working better? Are you helping people more effectively? Are you achieving what you came here to achieve? Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for your thoughts. And if you, Elizabeth, have another 30 minutes to hang and to stay with us, we will have a question and answer session after the talk of Gregory Cutts. So thanks again, and talk to you in a moment with other questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Gregory Cutts. He came to us by DGV from Paris, where he's a professor of innovation management and value in health at the University of Paris Descartes Ecole de Médecine. And he is a highly visible and very active personality in the value-based healthcare scene. He has written and conceptualized the, the EIT report on the landscape of value-based healthcare in Europe. And he now has, among many other things, he has, I think, a company, Promptime, which, on behalf of the French Ministry of Health, uh, tries to establish a cataract uh, outcome registry. And so he is extremely well positioned to follow up on the question I asked Elizabeth, you know, driving change in the healthcare system with PROMS. How do we do that in Europe? Gregory, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Christophe. It's a real honor to be here today. Thank you for your invitation. The starting point of my speech is this shocking chart. It's shocking for a number of reasons. If you go in the middle in Belgium, you see that the mortality rate for rectal cancer surgery varies by 700% whether you are operated in Louvain or in Brussels. In the UK, the 30-day mortality rate after emergency hospital admission for COPD varies by 1,500%, depending on which hospital or primary care trust you are treated. In Sweden, the capsular complication rate varies by 3,100% following cataract surgery, depending on which surgeon is operating you. 3,100% for a basic surgery such as cataracts. It's shocking because we are currently discovering through these outcome-based registers, which are risk-adjusted to patient severity profiles, that we are currently operating care in the pre-industrial era. The industrial era is when you can replicate one procedure from one place to the other. But when you see such level of variation, it shows that there is a tremendous room for improvement despite decades of checklists, decades of guidelines. Focusing on processes is absolutely essential. But that's not enough. The second reason why this chart is, sho is shocking, it's because patients are kept in the dark. They are simply uninformed about 
which medical team delivers the highest outcomes. And they simply cannot orient themselves as health system users and taxpayers. Another reason why this chart is shocking is that there's just a handful of flags here. What about Italy? What about Switzerland? What about France? Another reason why it's very shocking is that because practitioners don't have access to this outcome variation, they are deprived from improving their practices and delivering high value care. They are deprived from learning from peers. They are deprived from training and changing their clinical routine. Lastly, what is really shocking is that those who deliver poor outcomes have a higher re-intervention rate and are, and are financially incentivized. They will get or generate more revenues because they will have two surgeries rather than one compared to those who deliver high value care. This has to change. This is why we have published last year <clears throat> this EU report on implementing high-value uh, high care. It's not on why value-based health care is important, it's how to implement it. And I'm grateful to many of some colleagues in this room, especially Florian and many others, who, are, uh, who have contributed significantly to uh, help us designing um, uh, an implementation matrix as a roadmap with best practices to make this implementation successful. Having the idea of creating an outcome-based registry is not enough. You need to get prepared. There are so many reasons to fail. It's a, the implementation part is a real, true challenge. This is why we, we benchmark 22 uh, EU countries. We've interviewed nearly 250 VBHC experts to understand what are the causes for success and pitfalls. And we came up with this implementation matrix. It's a canvas with five dimensions. Recording, comparing, rewarding, improving, and partnering. Nine building blocks. First of all, detect, identify, appoint a third party, a neutral facilitator that will enable benchmarks with an independent audit of clinical outcomes across different medical teams. Because the essence of Valuable Zasker is open benchmarks of outcomes. For that, you need a neutral third party. You need also a, a neutral facilitator in order to align forces. This requires a third party. If you don't have a third party, you will just compare the outcomes with yourself and look at your belly button in the mirror. There is little room for improvement. Second thing is how to mobilize internal forces. Get the support from your board. And this is the case here in Basel. This is why th this is a, a really a pioneering case. Also make sure you design a scorecard that makes sense with processes, cost indicators, and of course, outcome measures that are risk adjusted. Of course, a data platform. Data platform is important, but clearly this is like basic. You cannot possibly develop open benchmark if, are, if you don't have dematerialized data. I'm stressing this because most of people consider that we need to focus on IT and data platform is important. It is important, but that's clearly not the, the greatest challenge of all. Internal and external benchmarks are important, especially external benchmarks. Investments, project management, IT, and return on investments. It's not only economic return on investments. Most of people think about remuneration. But what about reputation? Psychological incentives are essential, especially if you enter into open benchmarks. 
not only payment, not only remuneration, and learning community. The iterative cycles, plan, do, study, act. It's not a circle, it's a spiral, because you improve over time. So these cycles require a community of players ready to share in a peer-to-peer -peer dialogue processes and learn from peers. That, in, that implies being capable of listening your peers, listening to routines that you haven't developed, listening to what others are doing and trying also with humility to retrace your footstep and change what you initially thought as a dogma. Lastly, external collaborations with payers, public, private insurers, also academia, collaborations with patient representatives, associations. That is also a part of uh, the journey. Industrial manufacturers, of course, are also uh, important players to partner with, especially uh, in the perspective of outcome-based procurement. So that's the big picture. Now, we've used this matrix in a number of circumstances to verify if this framework applies to a number of cases. It applies to university hospitals, such as Uppsala Academic Hospital. Here in Basel, Karolinska is actually a negative case. It was a beautiful, ambitious case that actually failed to implement VBHC for a number of ancillary reasons where the hospital has to move from one place to the other and uh, was also uh, uh, confronted to uh, real estate uh, uh, difficulties and this created a lot of frustration. So VBHC, and this is the key learning from um, Karolinska, VBHC is an Everest on its own. Make sure you don't climb two mountains at the same time. Get really focused and serious about this implementation and how demanding this journey is. Santéon, private group of teaching hospitals in the Netherlands, of course, Martini Clinic. Um, Diabeter, I'm pretty sure that many of you are familiar with this uh, uh, chronic care outpatient clinic in the Netherlands. A third party uh, quality registry, the Netherlands Heart Registry is also very, very uh, illustrative because you have beyond uh, this uh, uh, third party quality registry, uh, a number of private insurers negotiating based negotiating uh, bundled payments and contracts with providers based on the data uh, published and audited by NHR. NHS Wales is probably the most illustrative case uh, in Europe, which is actually a top-down initiative. Most of them are bottom-up, where you have a, a full picture, a full commitment of a health authority and a payer um, developing and uh, actually uh, spearheading uh, the development of um, the uh, out VBHT or an, uh, an outcome-based approach for the entire wealth um, system. Mensis is an interesting case, just like Achmea. It's a private insurer in the Netherlands. They have developed a number of bundled payments. And GLAD is also uh, using this kind of methodology, uh, the, the matrix I just showed, uh, this is a network of independent caregivers. It means that you have a variety of illustrations across Europe. We estimate that there are today nearly 500 VBHC initiatives, and it, it is growing. There's a snowball effect. It's a momentum where there's a common thread, a common denominator. All the managers or the champions in these initiatives have an entrepreneurial spirit. They have the courage to deviate from the classic volume-based uh, uh, model of health systems, the fee-for-service uh, approach, and this is also uh, part uh, of um, the success of their initiatives. Now, there's an important uh, point I'd like to make, because uh, over the years, uh, I've seen uh, a clear uh, commitment 
about the value definition. And Elizabeth Tysberg is a perfect example about the clear definition. She pioneered this de definition, and she demonstrates uh, with Michael Porter and many others how important it is to standardize uh, the um, outcome measures. But it seems that there are still confusion and debates over the definition. And why it's important to standardize the definition. Can't we be tolerant and accept a variety of definitions of what we mean by value? Well, tolerance is great. But this is a moment, uh, a historical moment, where we can create a normative approach to benchmark outcomes. And if you have too much, too many definitions, the risk is to fail achieving this benchmark. Today, there's a myriad of proxy indicators. And three words or concepts are often brought up. Experience, quality, satisfaction. These words may be defined in a many uh, ways by many of you in this room, and patients are lost. They are asking for clarifications. Are you talking about the cleanness of the room, hospitality indicator, or are you talking about mass satisfaction in terms of quality of life? So the term satisfaction, the term patient experience, is confusing, and we should pay a lot of attention to the vocabulary we're using because you'll see it makes a huge difference in terms of quality indicators we are referring to in order to measure value. First, PREMS, PROMS. There is today in the technical jargon a tendency to put them into one, let's say, acronym, PROM, PREMS, PREMS, PROMS, as if they were twin brothers. They are not twin brothers. Nobody's denying that PREMS are important, but they are hospitality indicators. They refer to comfort during treatment. They refer to communication with caregivers. This is important. Nobody's denying this. PROMS measure the end result of care, which is quality in daily life. It means also functional reco recovery, which is reflect reflected by quality of life. We cannot put these two dimensions at the same level, especially because they would have the same etymology. Hospitality, hospital, it sounds like it's the same concepts. This is why we will use the net promoting score applied to hotels, actually, to healthcare. Well, it's a nonsense. A good hotel is a place where you wish to come back. A good hospital is a place where you don't need to come back. So PROs measure success in healthcare. And actually, we are witnessing a number of hospitals pretending they are jumping on value-based healthcare by simply measuring PREMS. PREMS is now becoming an excuse to avoid measuring PROMS. Oh, yes, it's patient-reported. Yes, it's patient-reported. But we cannot measure everything. We need a clear hierarchy of quality indicators. And unless we get this clear hierarchy, we will get lost and actually exhausted because measuring too many things means that you are at the end measuring nothing. This hierarchy requires clear choices. The second uh, confusion is outcomes outputs. There is a shift that we are currently uh, promoting through uh, the emergence of value based healthcare. Clinical reported output measures or outcome measures, such as PSA level, BMI, visual acuity, glycemic control, are not exactly what patients are looking for. Patients are looking at quality of life, which means for prostate cancer, keeping my pants dry, incontinence. PSA is not really a, an important indicator that speaks to patients. Or having autonomy when you're an obese patient, you should measure that directly, not through a proxy. Reading a newspaper 
is different from acuity. You can have 10 out of 10 in each eye and not be able to recognize the faces of the people you meet or read a newspaper. For that, you clearly need to measure outcomes and listen to patients so they can also take part in quantifying their own quality of life. This is clearly a subjective measure. And I've disco discovered myself some years ago now that subjective measures in medicine and in statistics is an entire field, scientific field, that is also uh, rigorous with some metrics, some limitations. So if a glycemic control is OK, it doesn't mean that the patient is not depressed. Let's come back to the WHO definition. Health is a state of complete physical and mental and social well-being. Crumbs measure only physical or physiological well-being, not mental and not social well-being. If we want to really meet this definition, if VBHC wants really to be aligned with the WHO definition, we definitely need to go beyond the outputs and measure patient outcomes. So that's the definition that everybody knows. But one thing is important, is to also have the idea that should be clear in mind that VBHC is not like lean management. It's not HTA. It's not con con cost containment. Cost containment would mean that you simply focus on micro costing without relation to outcomes. But this relation is essential. It's the sheer reason why you measure cost, is to make sure that you don't, you don't decrease the outcomes by reducing costs. It has to be the same level of outcome with a lower cost to improve value. So this relationship to outcomes places the importance, stresses, emphasizes the importance to the numerator of the value equation. HTA is about measuring uh, the incremental cost effectiveness of a device, a drug. Here, we measure the full cycle of care, the entire episode of care, which includes many devices or several drugs. Lastly, lean management is about how to streamline the steps within the care pathway. But actually, if you don't look clearly at the impact of uh, this uh, streamlined effort. You're incapable of really detecting if this is conducive or improving uh, high value care or not. This is why we need to understand that there, there's clearly, if we are honest about this equation, there's clearly more importance in the numer numerator than the denominator. And the denominator remains actually uh, a black box for payers and a blind spot for hospital administrators. Why? Because there's no harmonized definition about how to measure costs. And if you measure costs in Barcelona, you would probably consider that the nurses' uh, wages are different from Basel or Paris. So how can you really compare the costs? How can you risk adjust the cost also based on the locations? That makes the denominator complex to measure. But the denominator, per se, represents a huge mountain to climb. And we don't need, at this point, maybe to start measuring everything at the same time. <coughs> I'm saying this because the more you get focused on one measure, the more rigor you get in this measure, the more impactful you are. Standardizing instruments, standardizing the definition is the best way to standardize benchmark, which is the essence of value-based health care. Nominative benchmark versus anonymous benchmark. Well, here you have an illustration of the Dutch Institute of Clinical Auditing for uh, rectal cancer in the Netherlands. Each dot represents a hospital, medical team. You can see that uh, the mortality rate decreased by 43% in just four years. How was it possible? Transparency, the mirror effect. Every team under a light changes its behavior. 
It's part of the human nature. You suddenly discover that you are lagging behind. You want to catch up. You want to improve. So the transparency plays on this mimetic reaction, which is inherent to the conduct of change. You have a number of illustrations. In Sweden, the quality index for uh, coronary uh, diseases. You can see here that the year in 2006, when uh, the data, the PROM data, were uh, published, made public, you see that uh, the red uh, hospitals uh, are progressing uh, dramatically, nearly doubling uh, their progression in terms of uh, quality index. Now, uh, those who are lagging behind are catching up pretty rapidly with 40% increase. This is why uh, the Swedish authorities invest massively in outcome-based registries, which is the cornerstone of value based healthcare. If there is no outcome-based registries with risk adjustment and transparent benchmark of different medical teams, you are not doing VBHC. So the, the key thing is how to create these outcome-based registries, how to detect who will be the third party. Each Swedish crown invested in an outcome-based registry generates savings of nearly 100 Swedish crown. Not bad as a return on investment. And you have many other illustrations that we've seen with Santeon for breast cancer. You see San Antonio's here. Uh, they, are, they were benchmarked with Katarina Hospital in the Netherlands. And for breast cancer, the reoperation rate dropped by 71% after 18 months. This is a, a direct consequence of comparing each other figures. With anonymous benchmarks, San Antonio's would discover they would lag behind, but they would not be able to detect that Katarina was actually the front runner, was the medical team they should approach, and was also able to help them uh, transforming their care pathway. So that's also a, a concrete manner to accelerate the development. With anonymous benchmark, you deprive practitioners to enter into a peer-to-peer -peer dialogue, you also slow down the improvement cycle. It happened at Academiska Hospital at Uppsala, where you see uh, on the left uh, quarter one uh, red boxes, where they were under par. And for many uh, outcome and processes indicators, in Q4, most of them disappeared and turned out to be green. And the team also uh, showed a tremendous cohesion and and pride, actually, to improve so rapidly. So <clears throat> that's uh, the essence of the Plan, Do, Study, Act approach, which actually sorry, um, is also paving the way for uh, nominative benchmarks. We had, uh, two years ago, this uh, benchmark, uh, nominative benchmark, uh, deployed by the NHS England with a clear scorecard for uh, joint replacement, thanks to the National Joint Registry. And you have also a pictogram showing who is uh, above and below the average. So this ranking with proms and crumbs is probably uh, a harbinger of, uh, of, the future, of the future. Spire in the UK, one of the largest group of private clinics, is also benchmarking uh, outcomes against NHS for um, hip replacement. So. <clears throat> The mirror to improve is the essence of VBHC, but you need to be at least two players in order to improve. This is also why uh, we are developing with um, Jens Deberg, with uh, Christoph Meyer and others, uh, the Newsweek hospital uh, ranking <clears throat> with the introduction of, of PROM indicators in order to upgrade hospitals that are measuring PROMs routinely, using calibrated instruments, and uh, taking advantage of, of those standards in order to benchmark rigorously. Also, disclosing the, the outcomes, if, po if possible. And lastly, if possible, auditing the outcomes to make sure that there's no adverse selection and biases. Now, the key messages of, of my speech is first, that you need a third party auditor. It's a sign of maturity. 
Uh, it's just like if you are self-declaring that your financial books are just fine. No company would today dare to do that. You need a third party, an auditor, to verify and check that there's a, a, a reflection, a clear um, picture on what you're self-declaring. So we have these stakeholders. They are part of the health systems. We have medical teams, A, B, C. Most of the time, you have VBHC uh, fans trying to measure their outcomes in silo. C is outperforming, but ignores that C is performing because they are not benchmarking with A and B. The idea of a learning community is to enable C to detect that they are outperforming and share their results with A and B to also create this learning traction. This implies a third party. Without a third party, there's no learning community. Then you disseminate the data to all stakeholders with two impact. First, remuneration. Second, reputation. Remuneration implies outcome-based payment and value-based procurement. Reputation implies patient referrals and also attractiveness for research grants and disruptive innovations. So these are the return on investment. But it takes time. It takes time, and I wanted just to share with you a recent uh, achievement that uh, happened in France with the Ministry of Health and the national payer who commissioned my team to derogate to the common law and launch a nominative benchmark of practitioners' health gain and also attributed a uh, fee for transparency of 30 euro every time a practitioner discloses his or her outcomes. And of course, prime time as a third party is accountable for testing, auditing, checking that there are no biases or adverse selection where only the easy cases will be brought up and the complex cases with poor outcome will actually be uh, undisclosed. So this is also a uh, a, uh, easy to do uh, things, you know, the patient volume, the response rate. There are many ways to make sure that uh, this uh, holistic architecture makes sense. First, you need to standardize and calibrate the instruments because when they are, let's say, uh, iCHAM instruments or d data dictionary in English, it's not easy to make sure that they can be implemented in Spanish in Madrid, Barcelona, and Bilbao. Sometimes you have 1% difference in the translation, and all the benchmark collapse. You digitize. This requires API, and we are now developing machine-readable set. My team is uh, cooperating with iCHAM in order to uh, develop a new generation of uh, interoperable standard set that are dematerialized and uh, rapidly adaptable to uh, medical software, regardless uh, the, the hospitals or the software used. Then you develop comparison benchmarks with risk-adjusted severity profiles. You audit them with statistical testing to make sure that uh, you don't hide data. Everything is transparent. You also strengthen uh, the integrity of data. And you incentivize through remuneration, through reputation. You share the data. That's a key thing because you need to make sure the layperson can understand what they visualize. And the public report is also important to detect which teams are leading the way. So you can also organize virtual learning series, e-learning modules, make sure that uh, each member of this uh, VBHC uh, community is capable of learning from peers. So they are, of course, each member is competing individually, but you can achieve this competition only through a collective learning. This is the beauty of VBHC. Now, the last part, which is, I think, the cornerstone is the governance. You need a clear governance with a scientific board, 
also a de deontological board to make sure that you operate in a safe environment. This is what we have created. It takes time. We have separated uh, the governance with two bodies, one operational body prompt time specifically dedicated to uh, operational excellence implementation with the Ministry of Health, with the Assurance Maladie, with industrial players. And on the left, you have a nonprofit body gathering the scientific uh, societies, the union of professionals, patient representatives, also public hospital procurement. We also calibrated, and that's something you should really pay attention to. Um, we have calibrated EPROM instruments. If you translate them according to the ISPOR guidelines, that's not enough. You will continue to face a tremendous bottleneck, which is how to transform PDF documents with each data entry point into a standardized format for each variable. That requires digitization, but that requires also interoperable, um, uh, interoperability with medical software editors. And that's also the next hurdle you will have to overcome. So this is what we are currently uh, co-developing with iCharm. So <clears throat> uh, the last thing is what we are now uh, pioneering, because this is really like something uh, that we didn't expect to do as fast, is that the Federation of uh, Public Hospitals is launching next year an outcome-based tendering to purchase lenses for cataracts. 500, 500 public hospitals are now purchasing or launching this tendering process to purchase IOLs using outcome-based uh, data audited through a risk-adjusted uh, methodology with transparent benchmark. So since you have three categories of patients, no comorbidity, non-severe comorbidity, or severe comorbidity, you can end up, this is of course a fictive picture, with possible uh, uh, categories where one manufacturer achieves more or higher outcomes than the other for the next category. And then you can stratify uh, and split, actually, the tendering process, which will no longer be only based on volume and prices, but also based on outcome according to the severity categories. The last word is about the impact of outcome-based measures on clinical trials. This is a topic that is uh, often overlooked, and it's also extremely important, especially uh, for university hospitals that are conducting uh, clinical investigations. There is today the emergence of an alternative model to the RCT. It's the registry randomized clinical trial. A classic case is uh, the thrombus aspiration. Uh, and you have the Sweetheart registry in Sweden that uh, launched uh, a clinical investigation to verify that the thrombus aspiration had a clinical benefit on the mortality rate uh, associated with PCI. So this trial was sponsored by Medtronic and Terumo. And uh, uh, you had two publications in the New England Journal of Medicine, RCT, registry randomized trial. Same results, exactly the same level of evidence same journal, one year difference. What, what is the key learning here? The key learning is that <clears throat> the RCT trial <coughs> was over six months. The registry randomized trials over 40 month, 42 months. And the cost was dramatically different. 30 times more expensive was the RCT compared to the registry randomized trial. Of course, this has to be, uh, uh, you need to take into consideration the setup cost of this registry. But the future of VBHC is also through these registries to provide, deliver, generate evidence that also impact clinical guidelines. 
You see, before the trial, the use of thrombus aspiration, mechanical uh, aspiration, was very high, and five years after, dropped dramatically. We had also a strong impact on clinical guidelines. You see here the European uh, uh, Society uh, <clears throat> for Cardiology that recommended, or at least mentioned it should be considered, and five years after, with a higher level of evidence, demonstrated that it should not be uh, recommended. So the transformation of guidelines is also clearly linked to, uh, to this. My conclusion is that <clears throat> if you align vision skills, incentive resources, and action plan, you have change. If you miss one of these elements, you generate confusion, anxiety, slow change, frustration, and false start. So embarking on a VBHC journey is a long year endeavor. It's a multi-year endeavor that should certainly require cautious uh, investments. You should start maybe with baby steps, but watch out. If you ride a bicycle, riding too slow may cause hazard. My point is that if you don't really play by the rule of VBHC, you may get lost at one point by investing a lot of efforts without clearly reaching the top objective that you had in mind, which is open benchmark, audited, audited by a third party with this learning community dedicated to deliver high value care. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gregory, for this fantastic talk with very impressive data and your call for transparency, as Elizabeth did, as one of the main drivers for change. So we open now the discussion to the questions which have come in, and I would ask my colleagues to project them. Okay, and Elizabeth is with us again. Hello. So the first question to Elizabeth Theisberg is, what have been the most critical success factors to establish such a holistic care, and what would the clinic need to successfully implement this? Elizabeth. We read the question one more time, yeah. so I'm sure. What have been the most critical success factors to establish such a holistic care, and what would the clinic need to successfully implement this? So, probably the most important uh, success factor is the identification of purpose. When the clinical team says, you know, we're going to drive improvement in the outcomes that matter to our patients, and the team aligns around that, that goal, the chance of success goes way up. Um, the, the, so often people will say, you know, payment has to change first, but actually, you know, the most critical incentive is your professionalism and your, your desire to improve the, the health of your patients, the outcomes that you achieve with them, the difference that you make. And so really that identification of why we're here is a really critical success factor. People often then ask, well, so do we need to change the clinical care first or start measuring the outcomes first? <laughs> yes, you, you're going to need to do, to do both. Um, you getting started on measuring outcomes is easy. You don't have to start with a full blown system. You can start with measuring, uh, measuring something simple. Most efforts start with uh, an Excel spreadsheet or even pencil and paper as people are starting to figure out that they get insight from measuring. Uh, so 
getting started on majoring something meaningful is uh, really, really enabling. And then you need to think about how does the care need to be different to achieve much better outcomes? And uh, so, so you will need to make clinical changes. It's not just a matter of documenting, documenting what you do. I think that forgetting that, forgetting the, the patient centricity and the relationship centricity of this is a major mistake. That um, whatever, if you want to be on a journey to high value healthcare, you have to set the destination first. So you have to start with by understanding what it is that's really important to patients and what it is that's getting in the way of the patient and the clinical team in achieving those, those outcomes. So key success factor, aim at purpose, start with your patients and, um, and then pay attention to both your, the changes that you need to make in your clinical process as you're, as you're learning and measuring something. If you don't yet have a benchmark, measure against yourself because you can at least see your own improvement. And many of the, of the efforts that are now quite advanced started with places trying to make year over year improvement um, with their own patients and in their own numbers when they couldn't find others to work with them. Uh, as soon as you can benchmark, that's great. Thank you very much for your response, Elizabeth. I read you the next question. How, in your view, could patients themselves become drivers of change in healthcare? Perhaps, Gregory, do you want to take that? Well, patients uh, are involved <clears throat> in the design of the instruments uh, with qualiticians, with clinicians, and uh, the fact that they are uh, also, they have a voice in selecting which uh, outcome indicators are part or integrated in the instrument is central. This is why there's such a high response rate for PRAMS, which is often above 90% compared to, let's say, PRAMS, where it's nearly uh, most of the time below 20%. So that's also the first thing. The, the other element is that um, patients uh, are also uh, invited to discuss with the clinician uh, their outcomes during consultations. And this is the case also here in Basel. Uh, this creates, through this dialogue, a deeper understanding of the patient expectations and a, a realistic uh, ambition or aspiration in terms of patient outcomes. But patients are also uh, uh, invited to have a an active role in designing their care pathway. So this is the modern era of medicine where uh, the doctor has, of, of course, expertise and knowledge, but also a new form of humility uh, thanks to quantitative instruments that uh, also uh, are actionable. So that's also an important, tremendous difference from the past century. Thank you, Gregory. <laughs> I think if Lauren allows, we'll take one more question. We are a bit behind, but it's okay. Okay. Um, I don't know who wants to take that one, Elizabeth or Gregory. Currently, BBHC in Switzerland is driven by personal motivation of individuals. How can we make payers and politicians care and activate supporters? Perhaps Elizabeth, you know, with the basis of your report from 2008 and sort of a follow-up to the question I asked you, do you have something to add? Uh, so the question is, is, how can we get? Payers and politicians uh, to, to embark on VHBC in Switzerland, in Switzerland. <laughs> Understood. Um, the point that Gregory started with is perhaps, um, is perhaps the, the way to point us right here. The variation, the unwarranted variation in outcomes is shocking. And paying attention to that and recognizing that this is not what we want healthcare to be. It's 
people believe, I think whether they're politicians or payers or patients or even the clinicians themselves, people believe that their doctor is either immune from these variations or above these variations. We sort of need to believe that in order to have confidence in the care that, that we're um, receiving. But the fact is that there is tremendous unwarranted variation um, and that means there is tremendous opportunity for improvement. Um, and when we improve outcomes, we can achieve better health for more people at lower cost. It is poor health that drives demand and spending. So we need to be paying attention to getting the best outcomes we know how to get. It's not a matter of creating new miracles. It's taking that variation and pushing it to the top so that more people achieve the better outcomes that we know how to achieve now. And I think just attention to the shocking nature of the problem will involve people. I think it's got to be hard for people to look themselves in the mirror and say, this is okay, once they understand how serious the problem really is. Just in two minutes, I would like to give you, Gregory, the same question, because you have looked at several European countries. What should happen in Switzerland to, make, to implement this more broadly? What should politicians and payers do? Or how do we get them to do something? Let me return the question to you, Christoph, because when I visited you uh, two years ago with Florian, there were no politicians in Switzerland promoting value based health care. And you were a pioneer. Florian is a pioneer. And you said, we can't wait. We need to start somewhere. Of course, it would be imperfect, but let's roll up our sleeves. And this courageous answer is a bottom-up approach, which is an entrepreneurial spirit. Don't wait for politicians. They need to see to believe. They suspect that hospital administrators are scared by outcome measurement. They suspect that clinicians, doctors, practitioners, nurses would be stigmatized if they deliver poor outcomes where actually they are actually excited to improve over time. And they volunteer to work on an outcome-based agenda. So my question to you, Christophe, is tell us more. Why is it that you didn't wait for politicians and payers? Why did you jumpstart on the VBHC transformation at Basel? <laughs> I may say a few words then in the final remarks, but to be brief, I mean, you mentioned it. It's sort of also my, our ent entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, if you see a problem, you want to fix it. And you try to influence what you can influence rather than to wait until the others move. So, and I think that's something that's important. I mean, don't wait for your hospital to give you half a million to build up an IT infrastructure, or don't wait for the hospital to give you five positions to do it. I mean, literally, when, when we started that in Basel, when I wanted to do that, all I had was just moral support from the board of directors. I have no budget, no personnel. I had a very solid quality uh, team, and. Uh, Mrs. Sanchez is here, you know, she's really a sol you know, she did the ground quality work which is so essential. So I could use half of the team to do something novel with Florian, uh, Selina Bilger, and Annabel Müller without additional positions. And the money for the heartbeat software, well, I discovered that we spent half a million Swiss francs in postal stamps for PREN measurements. <laughs> so I trashed that and used the postal stamp money to build up the program. <laughs> With that, I wish you now a very good break. We resume at 3 p.m. sharp. Thanks again to Elizabeth, thanks to you, Gregory, and thanks for being here.
Face down on a broken street There's a man in the corner in a pool of misery I'm in a white van as a red sea covers the ground Metal crash, I can tell what it is But I take a look and now I'm sorry I did Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much that you are here for the last half of our symposium part from the symposium and seminar for patient reported outcome measurements in Basel. And it's an honor for me to introduce Professor Nicola Biller Andorno from Zurich. She will be the moderator of the next part of the meeting. She's director of the Institute of Biomedical Ethics and History of Medicine from the University of Zurich and also vice president of the Clinical Ethics Committee of the University Hospital in Zurich. And she, together with Christoph already, she's our partner for the series of patient, uh, patient excellence care, excellence in patient care, the other way around. And so, hand over to Nicola. Many thanks for coming and introducing our speakers. Thank you very much. Many thanks indeed, Florian. It's a pleasure to welcome you back after the coffee break, and I hope you're all refreshed and ready to engage with the second half of um, the program. Um, we'll have a series of three talks um, that shed light on different aspects on the implementation of PROMS. And if time allows, after each um, lecture, we'll have an opportunity for one or maybe two brief questions. But I'd like to ask you to um, leave your more substantial questions for the Q&A that we will have after the three talks. It's now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, and that is Jens Derberg Wittram. He is the Chief Executive Officer and President of Romet, a German nonprofit health system. And he's also the founding president of the International Consortium for Health Outcomes Measurement, ITROM. I've been fortunate to meet Jens for the first time when we were both at Harvard. And I was and I remain deeply impressed with his clear vision, with his strategic thinking, and with his dry humor. So I'm really looking forward to your presentation, Jens, and the floor is all yours.
Thank you very much, Nicola, and hello, everybody. It's, it is such a pleasure being somehow back at a physical stage. I have to tell you that. Um, I remember um, it has been 16 months ago uh, that, that I was traveling the last time to a physical meeting discussing value-based healthcare and PROMS, and it has been actually at um, Gregory Katz's course in, in Paris. And since then, my colleagues and I have been deeply involved in taking care of COVID patients. We had over 2,000 COVID patients in our hospital. You can say the crisis really turned everything upside down. And um, so I really, really felt relieved when I heard that there will be a PROM symposium here in Basel. I want to thank you, Florian, your excellent team, Christoph, the University Hospital of Basel, and everybody who has been involved in setting up this meeting at such a you know, challenging time. I think this is a wonderful gift to all of us. It was four weeks ago that Florian called me. I was, I was literally sitting on my backs on my way to Greece for holidays. And Florian called me and said, um, Jens, do you, or do you have already your presentation ready? And I said, no. What do you want me to talk about? And he said, well, um, the economic impact of PROMS. Hmm. I said, well, do you know what I should talk about? He said, well, I know what you should not talk about. So don't talk about you know, time-driven activity-based costing. Don't talk about um, you know, process mapping, all this kind of stuff. Um, do something different. And I said, OK, leave it to me. Greece will do the trick. Once I'm on the beach, the ideas will come. And after one week, I learned two things. First of all, the topic, economic impact of PROMS, is a difficult one. And secondly, fried calamari, white wine, and Greek sun doesn't help at all. <laughs> so I was close to giving up when I got a remarkable telephone call by a friend of mine at the 1st of June, very early in the morning. And I saw my friend on a FaceTime call as I have never seen him before, because he was in tears. He was crying like a baby. Red swollen eyes, clumsy speech. He said to me, Jensi, my mother is going to die. That was shocking. And I had a number of calls over the following days. And the good news is the mother is still alive. However, the story is serious. And I want to you know, use this true story to discuss the economic impact of prompts. And so I call my story the story of Sieglinde. This is a picture that has been taken two years ago when I was on a bicycle trip with my wife along the Donau, the Danube River. And I visited Sieglinde. Believe me or not, she is 86 years old, this picture. Every morning, she is beginning the day with a few leaps in her swimming pool. Then she gets nicely dressed. Then she starts preparing the breakfast, doing the gardening, visiting friends, being active in the community. She is the role model of an elderly person we are all dreaming about. And so it was really shocking to me when my friend told me about the devastating situation Sieglinde was in at the 1st of June, just two weeks ago. So what happened to her? The story was the following, and I try to show you this in a slide. So I... So it was Christmas last year that 
Sieglinde didn't feel very well. She was fainting once, and she was reporting acute shortness of breath. She was seen by her primary care physician. He referred her to a cardiologist, and they finally took the, the um, diagnosis of an acute heart failure, most likely caused by a severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. So, you know, this was, of course, already heavily influenced by the whole COVID story. So she couldn't go to the hospital. They went back and forth and finally they said to her, you have to go to a hospital and they will do a transcatheter valve replacement, a TAVI or TAVER approach, and this will do the trick and this will fix all the problems. I remember, actually, when I was visiting my friend, her son, that he was taking a telephone call of the heart surgeon who was the one who should do the TAVER. It was a heart surgeon, not a cardiologist. I'm very sorry for that, uh, Florian. So I remember this call because my friend switched his smartphone speaker to loud and I could listen. And the doctor said to him, listen, of course, there is always a risk because she is an elderly lady, but you know, I don't see a particular risk, but we have to do it anyway, because if someone is diagnosed with a severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, the likelihood to die within the next two years is 50%, so we have to do it. Okay, said and done. And so she went um, into the hospital they did the TAVER. When they did the TAVER, they realized that she had a severely progressed coronary artery disease, which was unknown before. So they put three stents in when they also did the TAVI. And after this operation, she was not doing fine at all. She was reporting weakness, no appetite, sleeplessness. So she had to stay in the acute hospital in Munich, tertiary care center, for three weeks, half of the time at the ICU. After three weeks, the colleagues at the university hospital said, well, we really don't know what to do with her here. There is nothing we can do for her. We believe the problem comes from, you know, not right appetite, not eating enough, so we should send her home. So they sent her home. At home, situation get worse. So the doctor sent her back into the hospital. In the hospital, they did additional diagnostics and they found a mitral valve insufficiency. A secondary mitral valve insufficiency is something that happens quite often, you know, like 10 to 30% in these patients. So they found and said, well, this will most likely be the reason that she is not doing very well, that she's not sleeping well, that she has this acute breathlessness. So um, they kept her for another week in the hospital. Then again, they said, there is nothing we can do for her. She should go home. She went home on the 10th of May. 13th of May was her 87th birthday. She invited her kids. The son is a famous professor and Max Planck Institute director in Germany. He came from Aachen, which is quite far away, to the house of the mother. And he said to his brothers and sisters, I will stay with mom and will take care of her. The mother was in bad shape and she couldn't sleep at all. So the son gave her a sleeping pill. In the morning, when the Sieglinde woke up, she realized that it was already 8 o'clock in the morning, so strictly against her personal schedule. So she went up, still under the effect of the sleeping pill, fell down and broke her pelvis. They brought her with a pelvic fracture and acute shortness of breath into a trauma hospital. The doctors there said, well, we cannot do any surgery with this lady in this situation, so we just have to keep her here and keep her still. After a week, she was still in bad shape. The doctor said, well, now she has to leave the acute hospital because 
somehow, you know, the DRG is over, and we will refer her to a geriatric rehabilitation center. Just for you to understand what is a geriatric rehabilitation center in Germany. This looks like a hospital, it smells like a hospital, but it is certainly not an acute hospital. So the per day rate, including all services, doctor services, diagnostics, anything in a rehabil uh, rehabilitation geriatric center in Germany is 180 euros. Gives you an impression what is happening there. So they didn't know why she was actually collapsing twice. And that was the time when my friend called me. She was collapsing, she was in very bad shape, and the doctors in the rehabilitation center said, well, she is dying, and this is probably because of her heart failure. We cannot fix the mitral valve, so she should go. Somehow she recovered, and a week later, she fainted again. She is in the rehabilitation center until today. And they finally found, two weeks after the collapse, two weeks after that, that she had developed a central line association bloodstream infection, and she was suffering from septicemia. This was most likely the case for the collapsing. It took two weeks in the rehab center to realize this problem. So now she is on antibiotics, vancomycin, high dose, IV. And the next plan for her is to get a mitral, mitral flipping, another very, very invasive procedure. This is the story so far. Now, the economic part you were asking for, Florian. And I just put in some rough data, knowing you know, what, the time, uh, what, what, what the price system in Germany is. I would assume primary care physician, cardiologist, acute hospital, 21 days, including ICU, including a TAVR with very expensive Edwards valve, three stents, at least 60K. I guess in Switzerland, twice. <laughs> I know in the US, four times. At least we are cheap in Germany. Then the seven days acute hospital plus PCP plus cardiologist, including ICU, a modest 10K. We add the trauma hospital without surgery, but including ICU for seven days, 10K. Um, geriatric rehabilitation, as I said, very cheap, unfortunately, including ICU, because she was referred to your ICU, at least 20K. And if God wills, and if she wants, and if possible, she might get a mit uh, mitral clipping, which would add another 50K. So, remembering the good old value equation, value is outcomes over cost, you could probably say, we have a very poor quality of life for 150,000 euros. And I think we can all agree that this is not a great example for high value care. So the question here is, is this just a sad story? Is this just something in the category of shit happens? Or is there something in it we can learn from? And to be honest, if you look more systematically at the care cycle, you might find some, let's say, archetypical archetypes of value destruction that we see very often in care. First of all, is there an indication for a TAV at this age, in this situation, with all these comorbidities and risk factors or not? Question you might ask. If someone who is at the age of 87, right after surgery develops a shortness of breath over such a long time, is this something that we might consider as a symptom of a post-operative delirium, which actually happens in this age group at least in 25% of TAVR patients? Is a symptom like 
the shortness of breath, the fever, and all the other signs of septicemia that happened later, is this something that could have been identified earlier, yes or no? Is it a great idea to send an 87 years old lady after surgery in such a difficult situation home and tell the son to provide her with sleeping pills? So is it a good idea to send someone without any professional nursing help in a you know, home setting? And last but not least, is there an indication for a mitral clipping? And is the hospital or the hospitals that the family of this lady of Siglinde have chosen, are those the right ones? So is, are these hospitals that are known for thinking about outcomes that matter to patients or not? It is very obvious that all these questions are related to prompts or could be related to prompts. So I would like to discuss with you to what extent prompts can be used in order to make the right indication. Because we all agree TAVI or mitral clips should only be done in patients who are likely to gain improvement in quality of life, full stop. We should discuss if PROMS might play a role in the transition to step-down care. We all agree geriatric patients need professional nursing support after surgery. And how can we identify those who need the help the most, and how can we make sure that this is done in a very structured manner? Complications like post-operative delirium or central line associated bloodstream infections need rapid intervention and can be identified by clinical symptoms, but also by changes in quality of life. So what can we do with prompts in terms of symptom monitoring? And last but not least, the question on transparency. I don't want to discuss these four topics just in theory, but I want to make it more real. And I want to talk and to share with you about current initiatives that are happening in Germany. Political, politically supported, financially supported initiatives that I personally believe should make us optimistic. And I start with the question of indication, which is, of course, not only a question in TAVI, but in many other fields. And I want to introduce you at this time to an instrument, a political instrument that has been introduced in 2016 and which is called the Quality Contracts, paragraph 110a in Germany. What does it mean? A quality contract is a contract that actually allows a payer and a provider to agree on additional payments for quality, particularly measured in prompts. I believe that this quality contract is a scandal because we introduced in Germany in 2004 DRGs, so we have more than 15 years of a fee-for-service system that is actually driving volume like crazy. And it takes 15 years for the legislator to think about a contract that payers don't have to simply pay for anything, but they might to agree with a provider on certain rules related to quality. I think it's a scandal, but at least it's here, and we can do something. And we have four areas where we can use these kind of contracts today. One of those is the joint replacement piece. 434,000 hips and knees are replaced in Germany every day. We used to be world champions. I think Switzerland is better now, uh, but we will come back. <laughs> Out of these 434,000 hip and knee replacement, um, you know, Institute for Quality in Healthcare is reporting 24,700 major complications, 5%, and 11,500 replacements are done despite lacking indication. This is reported. This is official. 
So the Bama, the largest German health insurance, made a contract with two of the leading joint replacement hospitals in Germany, where they basically said, we want to give you additional money if you were proving, based on prompts, that the patient really needs joint replacement and that the patient will truly benefit from the, um, from the um, intervention, from the surgery. And we will pay you extra money for doing that. You will get 150 euros per case if you were collecting this data and reporting this data to us. When I read about this contract, I was actually thinking a, a while and say, well, why do they do this kind of contract? This is very untypical that a payer is you know, giving another 150K, uh, 150 um, um, euros per case for doing prom measurement. The reason is very simple. The payer says, we know that these guys at Eisenberg and in, in Hamburg, they have long waiting lists, so they will fill their theaters anyway. For them to pick and to select the patients who are the most likely to benefit is not a problem. But we will get the data. And when we get the data that help us to determine who patients are the ones who will benefit the most, we will apply those data to all the other joint factories in Germany. And then we will benefit also economically from this approach. And good news, we are about to finish the first evaluation phase of these quality contracts and the politician, the parliament has already agreed that in the next years, the health insurances are actually forced to spend at least 20 million a year on quality contracts. So there is a major push from the political side that we will see many more contracts of those. And I believe that in a couple of years from now, there will be no joint replacement without pro measurement before and after, and probably also penalties for those who do the wrong surgery. Second example, and it's again another instrument that I have to introduce here, is on the better transition from one sector to the other. We have also introduced in Germany a while ago the so-called Innovation Fund on Healthcare Delivery. The Innovation Fund was introduced by the Federal Joint Commission, which is the highest body in the healthcare system in Germany, and they basically said we will spend every single year 300 million to those who are setting up projects, always payers and providers, who demonstrate that there is a better way to do care, that there is an improved way of care delivery. And this has to be done under a rigorous scientific evaluation. And in case that we were learning that this new care approach is better than, let's say, usual care, this becomes mandatory. This is the idea. There are many projects that, that we are currently involved in. This is one um, of these projects that we have started at Hamburg just a few years ago. It's funded by 3.8 million euros. And it's actually, again, the Bama and a BKK, a second health insurance, the University Hospital in Hamburg, and three acute hospitals and five rehab centers. And these institutions get extra money for making sure that patients from stroke units to acute care, from acute care to rehab hospitals and from rehab hospitals to outpatient aftercare units and other step-down facilities get in a very smooth way and that there is no one falling into the crack and by measuring constantly pros over the whole cycle of care, they want to determine what is the right care cycle for different types of patients. This is a way how you can actually fund a proper way of care transition. And as you can see, they are using the pro measurement iTRAM set and others. So there's a broad list. And um, right now we have more than 450 patients. And what we already see is we are comparing 
you know, two arms in a randomized controlled trial, we already see that those who get this extra, let's say, services um, are benefiting a lot in terms of outcomes. Third example is very familiar to those of you who are in Basel because it is very similar to what you are doing since 2017 in your fantastic breast cancer unit. Again, a project funded by the Innovation Fund, 4.8 million, three leading payer organizations, the Charité in Berlin, 40 certified breast cancer centers, among those the one in Rosenheim, and what they are doing is very similar to what you are doing here, a weekly pro measurement via smartphone app, automatic alerts when pro data report any kind of significant change or deterioration of health, and then the breast cancer specialists, the nurses, the doctors involve themselves and interfere. A good and a smart and a smooth way to do better symptom control in patients who are likely to suffer complications. Last, transparency. This morning, we already heard that the initiative for quality medicine, Initiative Qualitätsmedizin, is a astounding organization, has been funded, you know, more than 10 years ago by Helios and others, is a organization that is bringing together 500 plus acute hospitals in Germany and Switzerland who are agreeing on measuring quality, typically using standard data, and reporting these data in a very transparent way. IQM has very recently agreed on a, on a project um, measuring prompts and also putting these prompts on their platforms, making prompts data available for everyone in order to select the right provider. And Heartbeat is actually part of this project. So as a IQM member, you get access to a, let's say, premium package of, of Heartbeat services. But I think there is even you know, one sector that is ahead of that, and this is the rehabilitation hospitals in Germany. So we have an organization um, called the Bundesverband der Privaten Krankenanstalten, which is including many um, rehabilitation centers. And they have set up a rehabilitation portal called 4QD, the four dimensions of quality. And in this portal, they, uh, we agreed um, already five years ago that we want to report PROMS data. So we got together, we did a pilot um, measuring PROMS in rehabilitation in orthopedics, mental care, and stroke. The um, Institute for, for um, Psychosociology in, in Hamburg was actually doing um, you know, the research piece around it, and now, we have a system in place where we measure rigorously for various medical conditions in rehabilitation um, outcomes, PROMs. These PROMs are put together in a pro-QI, in a kind of compound measure. And this is finally reported in a very nice and simple way. So you can see there is a reha clinic in Rotterbad. The overall um, evaluation is an 89% of, so 89% of patients recommend these clinics. And when you go more into detail, you see that out of these 89%, you know, there's patient security, patient um, happiness. So the PREMS piece Gregory was talking about, the organization quality, but also the Behandlungsqualität. And so if you dive deeper into that, you get all these data, scientifically approved, rigorous data on PROMS. And I think this is a very nice way how you can, you know, basically report the quality of a provider organization and how you can enable those who want to dive deeper to do that in a, you know, pretty smart way. To summarize these four points, I would like to invite you to imagine a healthcare system that is vastly leveraging prompts. A healthcare system where patients are educated on risks and benefits of a treatment based on pro data. Not there is a 50% likelihood that you will die within the next two years. 
What is the likelihood that your quality of life will improve after this? And who can help you achieving this goal? And how can we use these data in a shared decision-making progress, not telephone calls with the sun alone? Imagine a healthcare system where pro data on frailty and other risk factors of a patient determine if a direct transfer to a geriatric rehabilitation unit or other specialized step-down care is needed and make sure that this transition is happening in a very smooth way. Imagine a healthcare system where weekly pro measurement by smartphone apps is used for symptom monitoring and early detection of disease progression and deterioration of health for all patients who are at risk for these kind of problems, particularly the frail and elderly who are exposed to heavy surgery. And finally, imagine a healthcare system where we have transparency on PROMS data in a patient portal that enables patients and relatives to choose the best provider. What would be the economic impact of PROMS in such a system? To be honest, I leave it to you. How many of the 150,000 euros might have been spent in a system that was applying all these things? And I even leave it up to you to decide if the money plays a role in healthcare at all. But I believe a healthcare system that is vastly leveraging prompts is not only saving money, it is providing more value to patients who deserve it, like Sieglinde. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Jens, for this invitation to dream about a pro-data-driven health system. I hope it's not too far-fetched, and I hope we will, yeah, we'll re-invite you in five years or ten years and see how, what progress we made. And thanks also for demonstrating the, the power of patient stories. And when you told this story, I, I couldn't help thinking as an ethicist that a lot of things had happened to Sieglinde, uh, who you portray portrayed as a very active woman. I was wondering to what extent she was involved in the, in the planning of her care. And thanks for mentioning shared decision making on your last slide, because I think, you know, thinking about the value of prompts, I think this would be greatly enhanced by putting it in context with shared decision making, making sure you know in advance what, what matters to her and later on measure if this actually happened. So thanks a lot for, for already flagging these important issues. Um, as time has progressed already, I think we'll have questions afterwards. Thanks a lot. And we can move on to our next speaker who is Sophie Christine Ernst, a research fellow at the Department of Healthcare Management at the Technical University of Berlin. And um, Sophie Christine also recently co-authored a report on, on national implementation of PROMS um, sponsored by the Bertelsmann Foundation. We are very curious to hear what you are gonna tell us about the national implementation of PROMS in different countries. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. It's great to be here after two years back at University Hospital Basel, a gemstone which we spotted already for the EIT report, a true pioneer in the implementation of PROMS. And it's an honor to share this stage today with some of the most distinguished experts from the field of value-based healthcare and PROMS after having had the great opportunity and pleasure to work with some of them already. And uh, I'm really excited now to connect some of the dots, some of the elements which we have learned about and heard about, discussed today in, in this presentation. So I hope you will find them there. And I'm very excited to talk about our work on advancing the implementation of PROMS towards a national scale, our PROMS health system implementation framework. And I'm presenting it on behalf of a great team back at Technical University Berlin and uh, in particular, my co-author, Victoria Steinbeck, who is here with me today, and Dr. Christoph Pross, who unfortunately isn't here today, but uh, I think he will be eager to hear your feedback at some point. So, first of all, the framework. I then will introduce you to the framework itself and the application of the framework, assessment and comparison of countries' PROMS implementation status, and um, 
Finally, I'll share some of the key learnings which uh, we derive from the development and application of this framework. So looking No? Yeah. Okay, now it works. So looking back about one year, we were asking ourselves questions that you might be asking yourself today. There's a lot of momentum globally around proms, but where are we? How far have we come today? And what have we learned so far? So in 2020, together with Bertelsmann Stiftung and Weiße Liste, we launched a project to investigate these questions to investigate the status of prompts implementation, challenges, and success factors across 10 countries. All the insights that we gathered through literature and through uh, 28 expert interviews that we conducted are summarized in this report, Prompts, an International Comparison, which has been published in May. Beyond what we learned about challenges, success factors, and the current landscape or mapping the landscape, there are two aspects which I'd like to highlight. And uh, the first of them is that the current landscape is very complex and very uh, fragmented. Okay. The second one is that there is increasing interest in prompts, but there is uncertainty around how to start and how to upscale, in particular from the side of policy makers. So this really highlighted the, the need uh, from our point of view for a policy framework that would condense all the learnings which we had already gathered uh, conducting the research for our report. So, So we had three goals in mind based on our findings that guided the development of the PROMS implementation framework. We aimed at a framework which would facilitate the assessment of current PROMS implementation status of the countries that would support policymakers and other stakeholders in identifying the suitable comparators and best practices to learn from and to replicate, and that would provide a common syntax to support discussions on PROMS ecosystem advancement. We went back to all the insights that we had gathered through the research and we followed a five-step, uh, we followed a five-step, we followed a five-step uh, process to transform these insights into a health system implementation framework. We first of all drafted a very first version of the model Excuse me, is there another code drop? Okay, yeah. <laughs> so we first drafted the uh, very first model based on the grounded uh, theory methodology and we performed an internal validation at our team at Technical University Berlin. We then passed on to the external validation step where we again conducted 24 expert interviews um, together with my colleague Victoria Steinbeck, uh, identified the 10 countries which we, we, we wanted to look at and to see where if the, if the framework we had developed, the draft model would actually um, represent what the experts learned about implementation uh, in general, but also in their specific country context. Finally, all these insights were accommodated in the final model of our PROMS framework, which I'll be presenting right now. So we identified uh, for the framework seven dimensions of PROMS implementation. Yes, now they're coming. Uh, so first of all, the first category that we identified is measurement. Here, uh, it's scope, it's the condition coverage, the size of the initiatives, it's metrics and process standardization, and it's tools and IT-based solutions. The second category is utilization. It's building on measurement. It's about patient empowerment, clinical decision support. It's about internal and public reporting and rewarding and contracting. 
the seventh dimension, which is linking those two categories, is culture and stakeholder involvement. Um, this is the key element also in our framework, putting those two in connection, measurement and utilization. And together they represent the y-axis of our framework, which is complemented then by the x-axis, uh, the development stages of PROMS implementation. So it ranges from first experimentation at the very beginning, passing intermediate stages, and can culminate in the national adoption and a, vi a vibrant PROMS ecosystem. Having set the stage, having established that metrics, we went back to our insights and we identified all the features that had to be uh, located in this framework with, for each of the dimensions and for each of uh, the development stages. And I would like to highlight today two of the dimensions in particular, which is culture and stakeholder and patient empowerment, decision support, not because they are more important than the other dimensions, rather because they are at risk of being overseen in the process of implementation at scale, of upscaling PROMS implementation to a national level. So first of all, I'd like to talk about culture and stakeholder involvement, which is the linking dimension in our framework. So culture and stakeholder involvement is all about leading by example and partnering to support the transformation process. In the early stage, in first experimentation, it's about clinical champions um, leading the way. And many experts uh, from many countries, if not all, reported and stressed that buy-in and engagement of clinical leaders is essential. This spark can spread and sometimes even already start at a dedicated healthcare professional team and hospital management. I think University Hospital Basel is one of the most beautiful examples for management and clinicians working hand in hand from the start to advance the implementation of PROMS in the organization. Training and change management are very essential tools on that way. Then, at uh, a scaling phase, we see an expanding community of practice, and here larger organizations can become bridging elements, such as specialty societies. We've heard today about, for instance, uh, the German Cancer Society, DKG. We've heard about other organizations, such as IQM and 4QD. Um, and in, in Switzerland, there is also Swiss Orthopedics, for instance, uh, a great example from the canton of Zurich. But I think that we have gathered here today is maybe an even more beautiful proof of this being real, of this being an expanding community of practice on the verge maybe already to a cultural shift among all healthcare stakeholders, uh, including also patient advocacy groups which uh, become more vocal. Finally, an inclusion of PROMS in healthcare professional education and clinical guidelines can be observed in some of the frontrunner countries already. For instance, in Wales, uh, which we also saw as one of the, the cases highlighted in the EIT report, or in the Netherlands, where this is currently uh, planned or partly implemented. The second dimension which I would like to highlight today is patient empowerment and clinical decision aids. So this dimension, and I think we've heard it many times today, is about measuring outcomes that matter to patients and delivering these outcomes. It's about placing the patient at the center of attention. Um, however, this dimension is of risk at being under-addressed, overseen, uh, in some sometimes, especially when there is more of a national approach, uh, a top-down approach chosen. It's about maximizing the patient's benefits and improving care delivery at an individual and at a system level. And often we see that patient empowerment and clinical decision support take some time to implement it. So first, experiences have to be gathered in the utilization of PROMS, and then they become elements of communication. For example, first in the consultation, they uh, become an element of shared decision making also but rather slowly. And in projects that we have heard about today, 
For instance, in Germany, um, this is currently being explored. First experiences are being gathered, and I think this is the same in Switzerland or here, for instance. Then later on, prompts more and more are reported back to patients. Um, there is more elements of uh, self-management also involved and more regular shared decision-making with prompts involved. With data volume and experiences growing, you can also observe uh, personal he personalized health recommendations being made on the basis of crumbs and prompts together. Uh, in some countries, there is also use of prompts for remote monitoring or telemedical uh, approaches of care, such as in the Nordics in Denmark or Sweden, where uh, prompts also are used to support um, the identification of outpatients at need for more clinical attention. That's, for example, implemented in the uh, field of epilepsy and rheumatology care. Also, clinical decision aid or uh, identifying the patients that are most benefiting uh, can be found here. So this is also what we mean by clinical decision aid. Um, and that was just presented also. Provider choice, finally, based on prompts, has been realized in very few countries uh, today. England was very uh, early in adopting or mandating collection of prompts. It was partly discontinued. It remains uh, in the uh, indications for hip and knee replacement. And in the Netherlands, it's currently being launched. So uh, in the government program, they committed themselves to providing insights into uh, prompts for 50% of the disease burden in the coming years. We already had a glimpse at what's going on in some of the countries, and uh, this leads us to the scoring system which we developed to assess PROMS maturity level um, based on the implementation scale and based on the level of integration, which we perceive and experts perceive as a very important aspect as well. So here, zero points to five points can be awarded for each of the elements, for each of the boxes in the framework depending on the scale and population coverage, and if it's a distinction between four and five points, uh, level of integration. So zero points would mean it's not implemented yet. One point is partly implemented. The uh, distinction between two and three points is guided by the expansion be, uh, be from first mover uh, conditions such as knee and hip replacement and the other area of orthopedics to a broader set of indications. Finally, applying this to countries can reveal not only the maturity levels, but can also reveal implementation focus areas, uh, which is very interesting. So here, I'd like to showcase this application for six of the countries uh, that we looked at. Uh, on the one hand, countries that are in the early adoption and moving towards the scaling phase. Um, here on the, on the left side and on the right side, a few countries that are considered to be among the front runners in terms of implementation of PROMS. Some interesting, interesting learnings that, that you might see also at first sight is um, implementation focus areas that, that stick out sometimes can be due to cultural or historical aspects. Sometimes they are also intended or a sign of the approach that was chosen. Um, also, you see that the front runners, for instance, have a more equal approach expanding uh, to all the, all the areas, all the dimensions which we identified. Others showing peaks, for instance, England uh, in the direction of reporting. Or in the Nordics, less of an emphasis on, on the rewarding bit. Finally, three key learnings that I'd like to share with you. So the dimensions work together as strategic complements, just like, for instance, in a smartphone, hardware and software combined deliver more value to the user. The dimensions combined deliver more value to patients and to health systems. A concerted implementation approach is beneficial. We have heard today that um, Climbing the Mount Everest or implementing prompts can also be, at a national scale, a very challenging task, almost like hiking the Mount Everest. So you, first of all, would go step by step. You wouldn't go right up. You would um, go a step, acclimatize, uh, gather some experience and learning, and then advance to the next step. Also, you would 
uh, go as a team. You, you need somebody to support and back you. And um, also, as a concerted implementation approach, we think top-down and um, top-down and bottom-up initiatives have to be connected. Um, so government backing and bottom-up projects have to support each other. Finally, integration across sectors and disease areas is essential for, for successful implementation of PROMS, for creation of truly patient-centric care, and to avoid fragmentation in particular. So we have submitted this framework as part of an article, and we hope it to be out very soon for you to use, to challenge, and to fill with life. And we would be happy to, to interact and would be very happy for you to reach out to us. So feel, feel free to contact uh, either one of the three of us. And I thank you very much for your attention and I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks so much for sharing this emerging framework. It was very exciting to, um, to hear that. Um, in the interest of time, I uh, again suggest we keep questions for later or put them already into Slido so we can come back to them in a little while. So thanks already for your very nice presentation. And we will now come to our last um, speaker, that's Dr. Florian Rüther, um, who's trained in cardiac surgery and a head of quality management at the University Hospital here. And he's, in, in fact, been instrumental in driving the adoption of PROMS embedded into a concept of value-based healthcare. Not only has Florian Rüther diligently put together this amazing program, not only has he led us through, this, uh, through the program for a good part of the day, but he will now also um, share with us insights into um, the Basel experience of PROMS in daily practice. I'm quite aware that Dr. Florian Rüther will need a week's vacation after that day, but for the moment, I'd like to welcome you and um, share your experiences. We're very much looking forward to this. Thank you so Thank much. You. Well, let's close the circle. We heard in the morning a lot of PROMS, how to implement them technically, how to use uh, software to work with them, and now I would like to show you very briefly our Basel experience with PROMS in daily practice. Well, this is our status quo per today. We have implemented about 13 item standard sets and over more five in-house developments, and there are still two sets under development in areas where there were no disease-specific item sets available. But to be honest, it's not always a story of success. We have areas where we failed, and we had a lot of learnings during the time since we began in 2017 to implement PROMS. And one very important learning is that you need physician leaders. And if you want to implement it as in a top-down style, you will fail. So we have some areas where we had to inactivate to stop PROM sets, and now we are lucky because now we only prom, uh, implement PROMS in those areas where clinics, doctors, or nurses are coming to us and telling us, okay, let's implement PROMS together, we need them. And up to now, we have about 4,288 patients in different PROMS sets. I hope it works, now it works, okay. And at least with uh, number two, we have a cooperation project in the lung cancer set. I will tell you something more later. Well, around the prompts, we have built up an ecosystem and with several parts. There's on the one hand the prom forum for all prom teams in the clinic. We meet twice a year to inform each other what's going on. We have, we have at least a quarterly prom update where we inform all clinics about their inclusion rates. We have the today's symposium. That's why we are in a learning community that's important to exchange our information, our experiences. And now what's, to my opinion, the most important thing is the PROM reporting. And this is an example of a radar chart from the inflammatory bowel disease item set. And it's very important to confront the clinics with the PROM data that they can work with them. And as you can see on the right side, that's coming from the already mentioned book 
from Gregory Katz, implementing value-based healthcare in Europe. And the photo on the down right side there, you see the auditing to have the university hospital later on in this book. Well, I think that's very important for future. The next revolution in healthcare isn't a drug, it's data. And there are those data that tells us what patients want and patients need. Well, we have two different targets. We have two levels. We have the individual patient level, where we can use the prompts to make informed and patient-centric treatment decisions based on outcome data. And due to this data, we can know the benefits of the treatment from the patient's perspective, transparent and controllable. As you can see on the upper right side, a screenshot from the hip replacement um, in heartbeat. And you can see the different points starting the patient with red dots. And red is always a problem. And the bigger the red dot, there is need for action. And this patient had a lot of problems in daily quality of life. He has a lot of pain. He was not able to go for sports. And so he really, it's a good indication, he needed a new hip. And after the operation, after the gray, you see everything's become better. Now we know it's really better. OK. And what we have could see, if the patient has a chance to discuss his own PROM data with the treating doctors or nurses, he will be satisfied. And so we had a significant increase in patient satisfaction in the doctor-patient communication. The second point, the group level. With aggregated PROM data on the group level, we can evaluate different therapeutic approaches. We can influence the therapy on quality of life data. And at least, we hope in future, we want to have aggregated data for shared decision making. So the already seen radar chart on the right lower side with data from inflammatory bowel disease and from breast cancer center. And this breast cancer center is a very, very nice exemplary how to work with PROM data. On the left side, you see three specialized breast care nurses. They look in daily work to the PROM data sent by their patients. And the same system. If there is a red dot and a big red dot, they contact the patients and they talk with them about their problems. And it was easier for the patients to talk about intimacy because they were asked before. That's another very important learning. And furthermore, there are different scores where you can imagine how the work you have done as a doctor, as a breast surgeon, how this work satisfied the patient. And as I said before, the results were, the benefits were, intimate topics were easier to discuss, it was a better and trustful doctor-patient relationship, and for the co-workers, for the nurses, also very important, you had a closer involvement of them into the treatment pathway. And you could broaden their range of tasks, and you could increase work attractiveness. That's secondary positive. And on the group level, if you see these data, I think you see patient satisfaction in this international benchmarking. These are data on the OECD level from 2019. These are the data of patient satisfaction after breast surgery and breast cancer for breast conserving therapy and reconstructing following mastectomy. And as you can see these data, I think every chief physician, Walter Weber is sitting up there, is happy to have those data and can compare those data. And this is good for the patient, it's good for the hospital, it's good for the marketing. Another really wonderful exemplary clinic is the Clinic for Orthopedics and Traumatology. They have a comprehensive implementation, not only for the classic hip and knee. Together with our quality management team, they developed PROM sets for all fractures of the upper and lower extremities of shoulder and infections after orthopedic surgery. They implemented in two locations, and they were really impressive, creative involvement of students and administrative staff 
for recording those data. Exemplary, the prompt collection is always before every consultation on site or from home. And they consequently discuss all the prompt data with the patients. That's so important. And at least they brought value based healthcare into their clinical strategy. Some more aggregated examples, another area stroke. These are the 90 day follow up day, uh, data of the PROMISE 10 score. And lower you see those different dimensions. And there were several insights and learnings when we discussed these and other data with our colleagues from the Stroke Center. First learning was it's not very easy, not a good idea to start with stroke as one of the first tasks because prompt collection acute situation and a patient coming with stroke is or she is an acute situation is not easy. You have to find good solution for finding those data. Coming back to this, this example from the right side, anxiety and depression. This 90 days after stroke was much better than expected. But on the other side, we should give more attention to the physical condition because the feeling of physical condition of this patient was not as good as expected. And out of this, PROM data were a starting point for new studies with registry data. Another example from the cooperating program from anesthesiology and our spine surgeons, the pain service, for patients with low back pain. They always collect PROM data and more often than it's described by iGEM. They collect them always before consultation and they can measure their therapy success and they can use those PROM data as a therapy control tool. And also from this team, you can look for your team performance and you can find possible approaches for, to patient or to more patient-centeredness. For example, those patients say that they don't get enough new impulses. So we have to prepare for new ideas in this area. Well, from the data, what else? What's going on in Basel? As I told you before, we have a cooperation project with a private-public partnership in collecting PROM data in the area of lung cancer. Why private-public partnership in this area? We have a really challenging situation with minimum three different treatment pathways because there are three participating clinics, the oncology, thoracic surgery, and nuclear medicine. And that's why we have a big need for cross-functional personnel. And that's the personnel, as Christoph Meyer told before, we don't have. So what to do? Now we have a private-public partnership. And also we want to answer common questions about the future of healthcare. Those questions were raised by Jens, Gregory, and all of these guys on this afternoon. And we want to create a win-win-win situation for patients, the University Hospital Basel, and our cooperation partner, Roche Pharmaceuticals. Going forward, we have to collect patient pathways, and we want to show the value equation. On the nominator side, we are not as, as bad. We have a lot of experience with sampling prompts. That's why they came to us. But on the denominator side, there is not enough data. And now we compare in one disease, lung cancer, with PROM data and all the financial data we have in-house. We want to build and show the value equation. And what we can already can show, where is the money going to? What we are doing in hospital and what are the costs? on a yearly basis, on a monthly basis, and there will be some more extremely interesting findings in future. We want to crack the total cost of patient care. And that's the soul of the cooperation between Roche and Basel University Hospital in PROMS collecting in, lung, in the lung cancer project. Well, coming to the end, I think that's the most important question 
for me the take home message of this whole day. Never forget the question, what do patients want? And I think this is the best conclusion. Achieving good patient health outcomes is a fundamental purpose of healthcare. It's so easy, so fundamental, but we sometimes lose it out of scope. And that's why value-based healthcare to solve this or some of these related problems came into the strategy of the university hospital last year. It's one of our strategic goals. And value-based healthcare is in the heart of our quality strategy with all these eight points around them. I think some of them are well known from Michael Porter's value-based healthcare strategy, for example, integrated practice unit and the other points around. Well, what that coming soon? Value-basedhealthcare.ch, Switzerland. Next week, we will have the founding meeting of the new formed value-based healthcare Swiss Society or Swiss Society for Value-Based Healthcare. If you put in vbhc.ch, you will see this picture. And from next week on, you will find more information. I think, I hope it will be a good exchange platform for all of those who are interested in value-based healthcare and PROMS and also for an international exchange. Well, at least thank you for your attention and many, many thanks to our local team. You are so great and without your incredible support and enthusiasm, this event would never have been possible. Thank you for that. And also thank you to all doctors, nurses, and administrative personnel of University Hospital Basel, of all the leading personnel who gave us support to make this real. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Florian Rütter, for you know, presenting us with, with the challenges, but also with a vision of how to move forward. Uh, I think that was very enriching. We've, we've now heard three um, excellent, nicely complimentary talks. And um, it's now your opportunity to pose your questions that you've had to hold on to. Um, we will again work, I believe, with this Slido system, so questions should come up. Um, for those of you who also wish to ask them directly, I think that's also an option. So as the room is being rearranged, I'm asking all speakers to come up again to the stage so we can have a joint round of discussions. So Jens and Jens. Um, So, I'm waiting for the questions to appear on the screen. And I'm also looking into the audience in case you have, as we have physical meeting, a simple physically answer that's physically put forward, please don't hesitate to do so. All right, I'm seeing the screen um, portraying the questions. So the first question here, which role do you see for the industry or supplier for the hospitals in supporting the VBHC ecosystem? I'm assuming that it goes to Ruta mainly, but you know, everyone else who would like to comment is welcome. Well, perhaps to start. Um, Wonderful question. Um, when we started to think about public-private partnerships in advancing our experience in PROMS, and we got the information by Roche that they are interested in this, the first feeling was uh, sleeping with the enemy. But afterwards, but afterwards we uh, got more contact to our legal partners and mm -hmm. to the Kanton Basel-Stadt. 
and in advance they supported more public-private partnership. And to my experience, it was or it is a great experience to work together, and I think it's not a mistake to um, start with this public-private partnership, and both partners have, uh, have success. The industry gets more insights to value-based healthcare, and a lot of partners, of the, especially of the medtech industry, and now new, the pharmaceutical industry, they have uh, seen that value-based healthcare could be a solution for future questions of our healthcare system. And so, for my opinion, it's really good win-win-win situation for, in this case, in the described case for the patients, for the industry, and for us. Yes, please, yes. Maybe um, a short comment on that. Um, I, I have had the chance to work for four years as a, um, the global head of, of value-based healthcare in MedTech at the Boston Consulting Group. So I got the chance to work with basically all the leading MedTech companies in the world on value-based healthcare. And what I learned after four years is that, you know, apart from, let's say, random projects that might happen here and there, we have to be aware of the business model of these companies. So I, we must not rely on, let's say, um, you know, the, the, the generosity of these companies alone, but we have to understand um, how they make their money and how they drive their business. And in case that we were finding something that fits nicely into this approach, they can be extremely supportive. You know, Gregory Katz was mentioning a, you know, um, huge public tender with 500 public hospitals on, on um, lenses in France. I mean, this is an opportunity. This is so relevant for the um, local representatives of, you know, the Alcons and the Bosch and Loms and all the companies you were mentioning that they must be prepared for that. And so in this case, there is a great opportunity to get together with these companies and to agree on, you know, how can we help you to understand that, make that happen, you know, provide infrastructure, access to patient, whatever. But um, I have seen as many good examples as examples that were failing because there was for a long period of time a misunderstanding what, you know, the different parties want. Yeah, so is there a genuine cooperation, is there, are there shared goals, uh, is there a shared vision here? Thank you. Um, we have another question regarding the use of PROMS in outpatient care, and maybe Frau Ernst would like to speak to that from also from your report. Was that something you've also looked at, the use of um, PROMS in not only in an in-hospital setting? Uh, yes. I mean, we did, uh, for example, in Denmark and Sweden, where it said this is not yeah, staying within the inpatient care, but it's also something that can help to bridge um, outpatient and inpatient care and to guide uh, and to identify need for more um, inpatient care. But, um, and I, this is actually something where I see also digital health having huge potential. Um, to, to become this bridging element together with pros and other data that can be gathered via um, devices like smart watches, maybe can fill this gap which has exi existed for many years now and ca has caused a lot of problems um, of loss of data, also maybe worse outcomes where um, patients didn't get the right care at the right moment. So yes, I think it's hugely important and Yes, there are a few examples, but I think this is still a field where there is much to do, much to explore, and I, I hope that also with this a huge attention now on digital health, maybe a little bit even spurred by the pandemic, there will be more such solutions um, coming up very soon. Yeah, particularly in times where the, the old borders between inpatient care and outpatient care are crumbling anyway, and new yeah. players are entering the market. Yes. Um, this, this question was also addressed to Florian Rüther. Do you have anything to, to add to that? But maybe concretely for Basel, is there anything planned for the outpatient sector? Yes, we had contacts um, to uh, the doctors, and they were really interested in PROMS. But I'm a little bit sad because, on the other hand, our way to collect PROMS is a digital way. 
And so they would need a solution, a solution for collecting data, and that costs a little bit of money and a little bit of time. And these are the two points the doctors, the peripheral doctors, the uh, practitioners don't have. So they are on the one hand, they are really interested in the project, but on the other hand, to realize it is in the moment the problem. But I think we need more support for, uh, from, for example, for the commission, from the Swiss Commission for Quality to start those projects because it's so important to show the whole treatment pathway, not only in hospital, to, for example, in areas where the hospital sees the patient only in one time, for example, in diabetes or arterial hypertension, where are very beautiful prom sets on stage, but we can't use them because the therapy in this area is mostly done by practitioners. And it would be great if we could work together with them to see the prompts and to see the whole treatment pathway of the patient. But that's still the future. I think it's so amazing we are talking 2021 and we still don't have an electronic patient record that at least provides a basic infrastructure on which these kind of projects could be hooked. But that's what it is. Another question for Dr. Derberg Wittram. Um, what would be, in your opinion, the ideal DRG approach in relation to the VBCH and PROMS mission? Thank you. Oh. <laughs> That's a difficult question. I mean, um, first of all, you know, there is a discussion whether we need DRGs at all or whether we should have them. I still believe that, you know, a, a, a component of a reimbursement that is, is um, actually, you know, paying for, for you know, the volume of services is probably needed because if you, you know, disconnect um, the, the amount and the intensity of a service from, from the payment, it, it's getting very, very difficult. So I think we probably need something like a DRG system. I think we must much more rely on diagnosis, as the name DRG says, and not so much on procedures as it is done in, in Switzerland and Germany. So it's much more of a procedure driven system than a diagnosis related system. And then I think we could add some, you know, quality components and pay bonuses um, or maluses on that. And actually there are some countries who have done that. For example, in, in the Netherlands, there are nice quality contracts where they are basically using DRGs, but they pay bonuses and maluses for improvement or meeting certain goals. Something like that is probably the next step we should, you know, shoot for. Mm -hmm. So a pragmatic combination that's yeah. to get as close as possible to what we have in mind. Thank you. There's an, a lot of curiosity around the VHC at the University Hospital Basel, so I'd like to give Florian Jutta a chance to just briefly comment, maybe without going into too much detail, if PROMS are the only focus of value-based health care, if you're doing anything else. And then there's also some interest in how many people are actually working on this right now. Well, um, to answer the first question, I, I heard it a lot of times, how many FDEs work exclusively on value-based health care? It's easy to answer, not one. Don't count heads. Look for enthusiasm. And I have two co-workers in my quality management department with Selina Bilger and Annabel Miller. Most of the time, they work for value-based healthcare and for collecting prompts, but not exclusively because we have to do much more other things. What you need to have is enth enthusiasm, committed personnel, and physician leaders on the other side who are the ideal co-workers for you. And especially for the um, private partnership project with Roche, we have 1.2 FDEs in this project. They exclusively work for this project for collecting PROM data in the lung cancer group. And that's all. But don't look only for numbers, look for enthusiasm and commitment. So amazing how for core functions, and I wouldn't exclude ethics here, we have to appeal to enthusiasm and cannot resort to FDAEs. But anyway, I think your point is, is very well taken. Um, I, I would like to address a, a final question to Dr. Ernst um, that it's really regarding what we already started to discuss, digitalization and the chance it might be in there. And the question here reads, there is an emerging trend to track prompts using apps. 
Are there any challenges for this approach? And I'm thinking maybe from your study and also looking at different countries, this issue of and the kind of using digital means to track prompts has come up in some way. Yes, I think there are definitely uh, challenges, not necessarily maybe limited only to collecting them via apps, but to collecting prompts in general. And I think it has been said already on stage a couple of times today that there has to be a purpose and a clear benefit for the patient. And also it has to, to yeah, cover the full range of applications, potential applications of prompts. It has to um, apply to the rules to be a standardized questionnaire, to also have uh, all the purposes in terms of the language to be a validated tool. So depending on what you really want to use it for, if you want it to be just a part of an application to have some engagement of the patient with this application, with their own status of well-being and health, maybe that doesn't have to apply. But if you want to have to have the full range, if you want to compare these outcomes, if you want to use them to measure the performance of this uh, hybrid sort of care model, then yes, you have to, to consider these aspects. And you also have to have something that is giving back, that is having some return of investment for everyone investing into it. First of all, the patient, of course. But if this is something being reimbursed, for instance, like in Germany now, you can prescribe applications. They also have to bring some proof of performance and in the area of mental health, for instance, that is in essence also patient reported outcomes. And yes, of course, then here you would have to apply a validated tool um, that is made for this country context, has been validated, and applies to, to these rules to be used. Yes, thanks a lot. I think the whole topic would merit another symposium even, and I think these questions will gain in importance um, or the next time. Um, I'm seeing from the question that a lot of, there's a lot of interest in what the value-based healthcare.ch is going to be about. Maybe we can keep this for a little later because I don't want to take, take too much time. For now, we have yet another highlight um, planned for you and that's gonna be a panel discussion that will feature not only our speakers, but also local protagonists who've promoted the use of prompts in Basel. And in that sense, I'd like to invite all of those who are part of the panel to the stage. I'd like to hand over to Christoph Meyer who will moderate this wonderful part of the program. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to have now a panel discussion, which I would suggest uh, I lead through two questions which I have to the panel, and then we can open to your questions. And I would like to structure it, thank you, in a, in a way that I would first like to address really the pioneer clinicians which were mentioned by Florian, you know, which are really Professor Walter Weber, Professor Bonatti, and Professor Rickley. I mean, without them, the USP wouldn't have the program we have now. They were the people who have driven the program. You know, Professor Wal Walter Weber was the first one initiating PROMS with us, and he didn't come and say, I need two FTEs, otherwise I'm very sorry, I'm very busy, I'm a surgeon. He just said, let's do it. And so, besides all that the chief, of what the chief medical office has done, I mean, the really key components are the clinicians. And I'm very happy that three of them are here today, and they really all promoted it tremendously. And if we have now the drive at the university hospital of you know, a waiting queue for new proms, it's because of you. So I would like to ask you. Thank you. And I would like have to have quick answers from each of you clinicians to perhaps three questions. You know, what did you initially expect from PROMS? Which hurdles did you encounter implementing it? And what kind of help would you have liked to have which you didn't get? Do you, um, have, do you have a microphone or have it? 
Yeah, oh, we have. Okay. We are okay. connected. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Christoph. Good to see you again in, in Basel. <laughs> <laughs> and congratulations to the organizers for this uh, impressive stage and, and meeting. So um, I wanted to have PROMS implemented because I've worked with them already 10 years ago at Sloan Kettering, and I like to use them to um, find ways to better treat patients on an individual basis because we see how they do and where, how they do where exactly and what we can do against. Um, hurdles, you know, everybody always complains they have too much to do, so we just put this on top of the priority list and then it was okay. And I was pretty happy with the way this went. I have no wish and I couldn't think of anything that could have been done better. Sorry, no area for improvement from my side. Thank you, Bartosz. Leo, yeah. Professor Bonatti, he's a neurologist, head of the stroke unit. Yes, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, um, well, we expected actually uh, something that would really um, power up our already existing registry that we have uh, in, in not just in Basel, but across Switzerland, the, the Swiss stroke registry, which we're leading, leading and which actually covers a lot of the variables that were defined by the ITOM stroke data set. So, it was really great because we only basically had to add the, the patient reported outcome part uh, to that registry. And um, our expectation was really to boost also our research by learning how uh, patients perceive their health versus by how we perceive their ability in daily life, which as you know, is one of the, the key outcome measures in acute stroke trials. And that has really come true and we're now excited to um, merge these data sets for the first time this year with the help of Selina and, and Florian's team. Uh, the, hurt, the, the, the greatest hurdle was mentioned by Florian, which is that it's, it, it's, it's unpractical and, and sometimes nearly impossible to collect acute PROMs in a patient with an acute stroke who comes in, who is aphasic, or maybe has neglect, who may be in a delirium, who has to go from one test to the other, has no time, he doesn't understand what he needs to do with the iPad, etc. So we had, we tried it. We never got past 10, 10 to 15 percent of patients. So eventually, we decided to skip the acute assessment because it creates uh, a lot of bias and focus on three-month assessments. Um, I, and the same as Walter's experience, uh, I couldn't have helped or, or wished for a better support by, by the prom team locally. What we really lacked was the capacity to collect um, the data systematically at, at, uh, at three months. Uh, but that now this has been alleviated by the help of a student who calls up these patients and does the, the questionnaire with them on the phone, uh, the patients that we cannot see in the clinic for capacity reasons. Yeah. Thank you, Leo. Professor Richter, he is Chief of Orthopedic Surgery. Well, um, uh, we, we are living in a, in a paradigm shift, I think. We go from quantity to quality. And the question in medicine, and the question is, uh, how do we assess uh, quality? And I think PROMS are the uh, ideal way to, uh, to quantify quality in a way based on, on data. And uh, of course, it has to be based on uh, patient subje uh, subjective patient outcome come data and we set up uh, <clears throat> a fracture database some years ago and the PROMs are the uh, ideal complement to the clinical data that I think in our field should be combined with the subjective outcome data and uh, that was uh, the reason why we started with with PROMs uh, of course, the, the biggest hurdle at the beginning was to, to get the funding for a few people to, to uh, get started the project. And, uh, but we, we were lucky enough to get the support from the dean of our faculty. And uh, yes, we are ongoing. There are a lot of problems. Our problems are a lot of steps we still have to go to make it more systematic to implement it even more to combine the clinical with the subjective outcome data and so forth. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. I mean, my question to everybody would be, how do you 
deal with the challenge of getting long-term data. I mean, prompts really live from sometimes a year-long, I mean, years-long follow-up. You know, in breast cancer, it's up to 10 years. And I think that way makes it so important also for industry to participate because as you may or may not know, I think for, if you look at the cancer treatments which have been admitted to the market over the past 15 years, only in 10% of the novel and highly expensive cancer treatments, you have quality of life data. So we urgently need long-term data on quality of life and PROMS. And so this is a bit easier in breast cancer. You know, usually patients are very uh, attached to uh, their physicians and they continue to fill out the questionnaires. But in orthopedics, you know, once the hip is in, it's in. And they stop filling out the questionnaires after a couple of months. That, or can you, I mean, what are the tricks, you know? I mean, one is, I'm a bit economical there. I said, you know, the insurance companies should offer a premium of 5% if you participate in a prom program. And, and then it's sort of mandatory and, and you just do it, but you get the rebate. But do you have any, yeah, <laughs> Jens? Um, you know, I, I have discussed this question with Hartwig Huland, whom you know as, uh, you know, the, the founding um, director of the Martini Clinic. You know, this Martini Clinic is a hospital that is actually doing prostate cancer surgery, and they have developed a system where they basically follow up all the patients for the rest of their life. And they have um, extraordinary return rates, like over, way over 80%. And I asked him, how do you do that? And I think the answer was very simple. He makes it very personal. Um, he is really, you know, they, of course, they are using automatically created letters, but the letter is more like, I am Professor Rickley. I have done your ankle repair three years ago. This was a major event in your life, and we have to improve and to learn. And it would be very, very helpful for us to learn. Da, da, da. And, you know, when you make it such a personal thing, like, the two of us, we are connected together in this very, very unique story that I did your ankle repair or whatever it is, your prostate cancer. It's interesting that people really, really feel this, this bond. I have had a personal experience when I worked at Schoen Clinic, a private hospital group for 10 years, and we were sending out questionnaires um, on PROMS starting in 2004. And I remember that once in a while, patients came into the headquarter of Schoen Clinic, where basically there was no clinical service at all. It was just administration. And they came there with, the, you know, using, using the train and said, well, my name is, and you were sending me a questionnaire, and I want to give it personally to you. And I said, oh my god, this is a hospital 300 miles away from here. But they said, yeah, but you, you sent it to me. So I think we sometimes underestimate how, cl how close the link is between you know, the clinicians and the, and the patients, we need to leverage that in the way we are interacting, and then we will get enormous response rates. Yeah, yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah, Florian? Well, I think this is the most important point, the link between the patient and the clinic, doctors, nurses, whatever. I think the, if the patients realize that these data are important for themselves, that these data can influence the treatment pathway. And if they realize that the doctors in the next consultation will talk with me about my personal PROM data, then they will adhere to the long-term follow-up. But if they realize those questionnaires as one of a lot of different questionnaires they get around their hospital stay, you, they will be lost. But you have to talk with your patients about those data, don't, feel only the questionnaire, you have to talk about those data, and then it will be a success. Thank you. Walter? Yeah, I, I, can, I can fully support um, this statement. I mean, it has to do with personal relationships and trust and faith and the patient being satisfied with the, with the treatment um, that she had. Um, so that's from the patient view, but from us, from our view, collecting the data is, is work and a burden. and. Um, we actually didn't do so badly with the top-down uh, procedure. I mean, it was a question of priority. It wasn't very romantic. We just said, we put this on top of the agenda and we get this done tomorrow and we start tomorrow and we aim at above 90% and 
So, so this is how we did it. And you know, clinical research is not far away, not far ahead of clinical practice here. And in clinical research, it's all about monitoring and surveillance and reminding, and then you, you pump your, your response rates up. So not much romance there um, uh, from the, the physician's uh, point of view, but certainly from the patient's point of view, it's what you've said, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. I would like to address now, particularly with our external guests, uh, you know, the, really the elephant in the room, and that's risk adjustment, adjusted proms. You know, we, we are now at least here, two members of the Federal Commission for Quality, Commissioner Flossard, and I think many of us would like to promote PROMS as one of the tools to manage quality in our country, perhaps to even steer reimbursement. But many of you have mentioned, you know, the challenge of risk-adjusted PROMS, but if you look at the literature, there are some, but it, it's challenging. And we urgently need that. Could, do you want to comment on where we stand, what needs to be done, and Gregory? Uh, yes, risk adjustment is absolutely essential to uh, prevent comparing apples with cars. Um, the starting point is to set up a scientific board because nobody wants to invent criteria out of the blue. So you need uh, to assume the fact that th this will be at one point um, arbitrary criteria applied to a population in order to stratify patient groups that would be statistically considered as homogeneous. Once you've done that, <coughs> uh, there is the Delphi approach where you pop out some ideas, criteria. It could be, of course, crumbs, comorbidities, and based on the social determinants and patient profiles, you will end up with a kind of list of criteria that you submit to a scientific board. And then you have this discussion, discussion, discussion. It's highly political. It's less statistical than political. But the most important thing in VBHC is, is not, it's not technical. It's not about an app or an IT platform. It's all about diplomacy collective alignment of people with sometimes diverging interests. So if you manage to coordinate this scientific governance, then you will eventually end up with some uh, a, a tentative uh, scorecard with risk-adjusted um, um, severity profile. This is what we have done actually pretty easily in France for cataract, which is, let's say, an easy case. Uh, but we didn't stumble bef be because we managed to bring at the same table people with goodwill, working in good faith for a dedicated objective that was, was self-transcendent. They were not, not like a ego discussions about I'm right, you're wrong. But it was, OK, we need to get this done. And for that, you also need to set clear guidelines in, and milestones and time frame, and also convey the message that there will be improvements. So this, it's not like written in stone. These case mix adjustment um, criteria will evolve over time, which diffuse tensions. So uh, once you've done that, you should definitely use this to uh, spearhead uh, procurement, hospital procurement based on this case mix adjustment in order to provide a financial sustainability for the model. Because this is the key thing that will transform hospital procurement and eventually fund uh, the long-standing future of outcome measurement. So there's a clear link between governance, risk adjustment, hospital procurement. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment on that? <coughs> Dr. Christoph Fossard, I know it's also one of your worries. Uh, do you have an additional question to the panel? Yes, indeed, I think it's very important maybe also to make a comment with the uh, peer review program of U UEM, I don't know, um, for the idea of the risk adjustment, if this will be uh, something useful as well. 
from your point of view. So you're referring to IQM? Please. I, I'm not sure I understand the it, question itself. Um, it's for the problem of the, the risk adjustment. Um, would it also be a possibility to take the instrument of the peer reviewing process, uh, process of the IQM in order to, to check out the risk adjust adjustment in the concrete situation if you have an uh, indicator flashing off? Absolutely, because IQM is a third party. Yes. And uh, don't ask me to repeat the importance of a third party, but definitely yes, IQM, peer review, you need to externalize this decision because if Florian at Basel with some of his uh, uh, leading uh, clinical champions will come up with a, a risk adjustment methodology that is denounced and criticized in Zurich, what's the point? I mean, there's no uh, momentum to benchmark Basel and Zurich. Everybody will come back and just have internal benchmarks. So third party is the place where this governance should clearly set up these uh, risk adjustment criteria, definitely. Thank you. So I turn behind me to the screen and the questions from the auditorium. Florian, that's for you. Interested in the new BBHC Swiss initi initiative and how this will connect with other initiatives in Switzerland, for example, Geneva and Lausanne. Together we are stronger, which is very true. Florian. Okay, the result, together we are stronger, that's absolutely true. But at the beginning, you have to make the first step on your journey. And our first step, together with some colleagues, is, for, is the founding of the Swiss Society for Value-Based Healthcare. And everybody who is interested in this, in PROMS, can participate. And after the founding meeting next week, we will open the internet page and everybody can contribute. It's a platform for exchange of information and everybody who is interested can contact us and can be a member. And absolutely, we are really interested to get more contacts from all areas from Switzerland and abroad. And everybody is welcome. Thank you, Florian. Professor Walter Weber, the next. in Switzerland, there is some resistance to agree on benchmarking with other Swiss hospitals. That's quite true. How did you manage to shape this mindset to more openness? Um, thank you for the question. It sounds uh, political, but I did not really try very much to open the mind of the other Swiss hospitals. Uh, we just benchmarked with, with whoever was ready and had the data. And um, our service is specialized in oncoplastic surgery, so we want to improve aesthetic outcomes and quality of life. I know of other centers that have the same goals, Sloan Kettering and Brigham, and they participated in the benchmark, so we did compare our outcomes with the right centers. Um, I'm not aware of any other Swiss hospital that would be ready for this, but I'm sure Christoph Zurich will be ready any time now. <laughs> <laughs> we are just adapting our structures in order to be able to, <laughs> to do that, I hope. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, we, we, we tried, uh, and perhaps Jörg Steiger can comment on that as my successor at the, the, the club of the five university hospitals to agree on a few proms which we benchmark among the five university hospitals. You know, and you were part of these discussions, Florian. It took several meetings to agree, I think, at the end in, on two proms. And I sincerely wished to have them published, so we agree in advance that we will publish. I didn't succeed. We said we will measure, but we will not publish. But Jörg, perhaps you have a more optimistic note. No, you don't. <laughs> yeah, so, so every Swiss hospital believes it's the best, but they don't dare to really put it uh, to the proof and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I can add our experience from the Swiss drug registry where we implemented benchmarking uh, before the era of PROM using uh, standardized performance measures, for example, door to treatment times in acute stroke. And what we did is we sent out annual reports to the hospitals that show their time and then the average of all Swiss stroke centers and stroke units uh, and that has helped the sort of um, philosophy, to accept the philosophy of benchmarking, because it's, it's kind of semi-anonymized. Uh, and also has helped us, as we, we have shown you when you were here um, uh, two years ago, to actually um, 
motivate people to become faster and we have been able to, to really lower our, our treatment times dr dramatically uh, from the time when we started this benchmarking process. And also it has political uh, I um, implications now that uh, the um, board for highly specialized medicine will, will uh, look at uh, centers having bad uh, treatment times, bad outcomes, and, and look at the reasons why this is the case. So it starts having political uh, implications yeah. already. And, and I think, I mean, Gregory mentioned that in his talk, you know, you have your three members of the Newsweek uh, uh, board selecting the 100 best hospitals in the world. And I mean, we three are really all very active that proms are a mandatory part. So if a hospital doesn't do proms, it shouldn't be on the list. Mm -hmm. And I hope we succeed in, in doing that. That will dramatically change the list, I believe. Absolutely. And, and then people will start doing it. But, uh, you know, I think it, it's, it, it's so true. I mean, pe you know, people who are working in healthcare, and particularly, you know, doctors, are genuinely quite competitive, you know? They were competitive at school, university, so this goes on and on and on. And this is something that we can leverage. And I think, you know, your experience, you have been to, to um, Morris of Sloan Kettering, they did that, you know, fascinates you, you bring it to Switzerland. So there is no competition between you and Memorial Sloan Kettering, there will never be. But there's always, you know, this is always, you know, one of these leading great organizations. And if you look today, you know, at the leading, for example, US academic medical centers, they all have PROMS programs. Some of those are greater, some of them are smaller, but there is no, let's say, top-notch US AMC that is not doing something in that area. Of course, there have been organizations like Cleveland Clinic and Philadelphia Children's was mentioned who were front runners, but now it became a kind of, let's say, minimum standard. And I think we have to, you know, and, and every single hospital, every single hospital service has to decide if they want to belong to the Champions League or not. Okay. And at the end, it's, it's, of course, the clinical leaders and also the leaders of the institution who have to make a decision. And I, I agree fully with you, Professor Weber. Um, we are in the company or in the hospital we are working now, we are simply, um, you know, taking a decision. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes it's a management decision. I would like to add one aspect that hasn't been mentioned, which is very new to me and I would like to share with the audience. Um, we are, I'm, I'm working for a regional health system for hospitals, 1,000 beds, that are taking care of a region of a, around 400,000 people. And which is very new for me, in many areas of healthcare, we are monopolists. We are we are running four trauma services and we are covering 400,000 patients and there is no other place for them to go. Same true in cardiology, same true in oncology and so on. For me, the question is how, you know, what is the vision for my company? And for my hospital, the vision must be we need to become the best served region in Germany. But how can I measure that? How can I measure that? You know, it doesn't make too much sense to compare myself generally with the university hospital in Hamburg or something like that. I can do that, but the question is basically, how can we become the best served region? So my, my you know, hope and maybe my vision for the future would be that we were starting to measure whenever we are in touch with a patient of the region, a kind of corset that is covering, let's say, general quality of health, and that we are adding a more condition-specific set, maybe, you know, a, a dash for the hand or whatever, EOTC for, for breast cancer patient, whatever. But we, that we are always continuing to collect these data and that we are, over time, have the data to prove that the quality of life and also the disability adjusted quality of life over the whole region is getting better because I think this is a measure of success and um, creating an ecosystem where you are basically reaching out to all patients, finally to the whole population and all to the doctors and private patients must be the goal. So 
I think prompts on a specific medical service is only a starting point, and I hope that we will get far. <laughs> Thank you, Jens. I think that's a, I hope Judith agrees with uh, that this might be the answer to your question. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. And so I would like to look at two of the actual remarks on the screen to, you know, go over to the closing remarks. I mean, one is from Yannick Schreckenberger, he's CEO of Heartbeat, fantastic event today, despite not being able to attend. Thank you to everyone to sharing their insights. Uh, you know, that's really a compliment to the organizers. And then Rodolphe Eurin, he's CEO of a private hospital in Geneva, Hôpital de la Tour, where he's one of the pioneers uh, implementing uh, value-based healthcare in his private hospital. And so I really would like to join these two voices uh, in thanking many people who made uh, this day possible. Uh, the perfect organization by Michelle, she has been hiding somewhere. Uh, yeah, there. <laughs> Michelle, uh, then Selina Bilger, um, Annabel Müller, Susan Sanchez, Florian, of course, and Jörg Steiger, you know, without his patronage, this wouldn't have happened. And I'm very grateful to Jörg that he continues uh, uh, this series and to continue to support uh, this venture of value-based healthcare. The speakers are fantastic. Thanks very, very much for having come to Basel today. And, you know, I think it is quite remarkable. There are not too many things happening between two university hospitals in Switzerland. You know, and this is really now for the past three years, a joint venture between University Hospital of Basel, University Hospital of Zurich, and the Institute of Bioethics of Nicola Biller Andorno. And that's not really by accident. You know, we have been talking about money, about quality, but at the end, it's a fundamentally ethical question we are debating here. I mean, problems, at least in my view, are just the measure at the end of all we are trying to do in medicine. And if we get a measurement metric in place, we all hope to optimize the system in a way that it is more reasonable and better medicine, better patient-centered medicine. Because if you think about the chain, you know, consequently, if you want to optimize outcome, you need first transparency in the quality, we have talked about that, then hoping that the patients will become engaged, you know, something that's virtually completely absent with a few exceptions, you know, somewhere here, but, uh, you know, the president of the Swiss patient organization, Susan Hochwoli, once told me she has, what, I think, 100 times more members in her Greenpeace organization than she has in the patient organization. Swiss patients simply don't care. And, and that's, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, they start, but, but they, they have no voice. I mean, that's politically audible. There is Anina Hess, a good, a good friend of mine, and Erika Tiltener, and many others, but it's not very prominent. So I hope through prompt transparency, we will get more patients involved, and that will drive really not so much the prompt development, that's our job, but it will drive shared decision making, you know. Because if you want to optimize PROMS, that's a highly individual thing. You have to decide between quality of, of life and quantity of life. And in PSA screening, in mammography, etc. And these are fundamentally ethical questions, which are very much dealt with by Nicola and also, also Tanya Kones, who has been here today. So the end result of the whole value-based healthcare system would really be that we care more about detecting and respecting patient values and preferences. And because this will not just happen automatically, we need a metric, we need a metric which promotes that and in the end incentivizes it and makes it visible. So with this, we are at the end of today. Thanks again to everybody. Thanks for you to have been, uh, to have come to Basel. And I'm very much looking forward to the next conference, which will probably take place in Zurich, is that correct? But we don't have the, time, the date yet, but it will probably be in November of this year. So I hope to see you back then, and have a good evening. Bye-bye.
face down on a pillow of shame. There's some girls with a needle trying to spell my name. My body's not a canvas, my body's now a toilet wall.